to show why I don't see it. Oh, okay, there we are. Bear with me, folks. All right, folks, good morning. Everyone should be able to hear me. All right, so today is the first of uh, my Price Action Chronicles. <laughs> so we're going to start with a review where we are in relationship to where we have been and then I'll give you my analysis for the 30 and the 930 expectations so we are going to go into this view here and I'm showing the raw chart with everything showing like at the bottom down here so that we can see what I'm doing because sometimes I'll put a comparison chart on I want you to be able to see what it is I'm doing how I'm doing it on trading view all right let's get on with this so we have First, go to dollar index. All right, for some of you that have been with me for a while now and have been with me since the beginning of the year, for the analysis on dollar index. Now, why am I even referring to that? Because it's a risk on, risk off barometer. It tells me if I'm likely to see continued upside going long in ES, or if I'm likely to see continued weakness in ES. And also it kind of contributes to, as you'll learn throughout this year, when I'm expecting consolidation, choppiness, uh, things that might be conflicting in analysis, uh, that means that I'm going to be looking for a lot lower degree of uh, participation with risk. So in other words, if I'm not looking for a really clean one-sided run, then I'll trade very, very small intraday scalps, not try to capture the entire morning session run or the entire daily run or even a large portion of the weekly range. So I'm using this indicator, whether if I'm doing analysis with the Forex market, if I'm doing it with the bond market, if I'm doing it with equities and index futures. Okay, so uh, all of my analysis, every bit of my analysis starts with this instrument here because it helps me frame the logic of whether I should be a, a, a trader that's assuming risk. That means buying foreign currencies or buying stock. And if that's the case, then I'm assuming that it's risk on and that would be a lower dollar. 
we were looking for a lower dollar at the beginning of the year. If you go back and look at the analysis videos that's on my YouTube channel and follow all the commentary on the tweets that I've posted on my Twitter account. I know there's a lot of it, but um, for those that have been here, this is old hat to you, but I'm counseling you not to take my word for it because it's going to look like it's hindsight here. But everything I'm going to talk about here was talked about beforehand. So it's kind of like a benchmark where we were, where we are now, and where we're likely to go to next. So it kind of gives you like a full circle perspective on what I'm seeing or, and, or expecting. We're looking for lower prices, uh, sell side liquidity. And that was absolutely tagged. And then I said, if we went below that, we have an order block and we have a fair value gap in here. If you look at the range, and I promise I'll be very, very quick through this because I want to be in front of the charts live at 8.30. So half of this gap between this candle's high and this candle's low, that's a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency with an order block. So the order block is the down close candle. Why is that an order block? Because it has a fair value gap. Price has moved away from it. So if it comes back down and retrades back into this candle here, we're going to see some kind of what? Reaction. Does it mean it's the ultimate low and the dollar never sees any lower prices? No. It just means that it's going to be a strong draw on price when price is above it, as it was in the beginning of the year here. Moved lower. We use the fair value gap here as resistance. Okay, drops lower, digs into the sell side liquidity. Throughout this year, you're going to see that while many folks that come to my work, they're going to say, or you'll hear other people say, ICT complicates things. I'm not complicating. I'm just giving you a, a, a deep understanding about what it is is available in terms of trading price action. Throughout this year, in live sessions and ongoing teachings, you're going to see that it's absolutely simple. It's very simple. We're only looking for one of two things. Is price going higher? Okay, if it's going higher, is it going to go above an old singular high, a swing high, or relative equal highs? Because above highs is going to be buy side liquidity. Or is it going to go lower? If it's going to go lower, is it going to go down below a single swing low or below relative equal lows? So multiple lows or a singular low. Below those lows is sell side liquidity. Now, if I'm bullish and we have a imbalance, what's an imbalance? Something like this and like that. And I'm bearish, like I was in the beginning on dollar, it's going to draw to those levels. So I had two points of interest where I had the sell side here. And I said, once we go below that, it could dig into this imbalance in this order block. Go back and watch the videos. It's in January's commentaries can't edit it, can't change it. What I want to take your attention to is the fact that we went right down to the middle point of that gap, which is consequent encroachment. Whenever there's an imbalance, whether it be buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, which is what this is here, it is a fair value gap by a category. Within that category is classified as a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, or BISI, B-I-S-I. You'll see that used a lot in my charts. A lot of my students have their charts annotated like that as well. There's three levels. Okay, this is what I argue all the time when people just casually watch my content or my concepts, they'll say it's supply and demand. It has absolutely nothing to do with supply and demand. It's three specific price levels that I'm, I'm looking for. The actual high, which is going to be framed by this candle's low. So this, this gap or fair value gap is framed with this specific price level, the middle, which is consequent encroachment, and then the low. The low is the less likely price objective. So the two most primary levels, when, you, when you're above it, trading down into it, it's going to be the high of that gap, and as much as the midpoint. Look at the reaction there. You see that right there? That's undeniable. Okay. Also noticed that I was framing shorts on S&P last week because we had traded down into this imbalance. I apologize. I got this 
new headset I'm using. And slide all around my head. <laughs> the uh, the reaction here on dollar, this rally up into this imbalance here. And we don't know yet because really we haven't really opened up and moved around a lot so far tonight and into this morning's trading session. So I'm not going to have a whole lot of this is what's going to happen at 930. I have to wait to see what we do at 930. So and you'll understand where and how I get that logic where you'll be able to do it once we're not doing this anymore next year and you're doing it independently without me. When you're looking at your charts, you'll know what procedures to follow and what not to worry about and what things you need to be focusing on. But we've traded up in this area here. So as it stands right now, the market has already posted a risk off scenario where dollar is going higher. That means foreign currencies are likely to go lower and or has gone lower or equities like stock indices and stocks individually. Uh, they'll see pre uh, temporary weakness against this rally in a dollar. So if you get shorting opportunities in like the S&P and your charts are communicating that there's a potential low resistance liquidity run, again, if you don't know what that is, you'll be seeing a lot of that throughout this year. Uh, that's what I'm teaching primarily to focus on. There's going to be a lot of gyrations in price action that are going to be of no importance to me. And you'll probably see them today in, in the future live streams where you'll question, why didn't you take that trade? It's not my setup. That's not the one I'm interested in. You might see it. So don't look at whatever I call, whatever I call talk or outline in price action. Don't let it discourage you from following a model you may have already adopted that's helping you in, in finding setups. I'm not here to try to twist anyone's arm. I'm here just simply communicating to the folks that are new this is how you go in and you start learning how to read the tape before you even press a demo account, before you even do any of that stuff. These are the things you're supposed to be doing. And it's going to seem boring, especially for seasoned traders that are already profitable. It's not going to be as exciting or helpful to you. But as we go further into this year, you'll see there's going to be a whole lot more engagement. But in the beginning, there has to be a foundation. So the market has already traded up for the dollar into this area here. I like the idea of it trading up into the midpoint of this up close candle, which is a bearish order block. The midpoint of a order block, which has nothing to do with the depth of market or level two data. Half of that candle is mean threshold. So half of a gap, like down here, is consequent encroachment. Half of a order block, whether it be the last up close candle prior to a displacement lower with a fair value gap. That's what makes this a bearish order block, not simply because it's the last up close candle before a down move. There has to be signatures and alignment that are agreed. And the midpoint of that candle is mean threshold. That means it's likely to draw up to this candle and as much as the midpoint. Now, what I'm interested in seeing is do we trade through the mean threshold? Because if we do, I've had this annotated here and while it was a volume and bounce initially here, here, failed it here. So now what's above these relative equal highs? Buy side liquidity. So buy side liquidity with a small little gap right there between this candle's high and that candle's low. So there's a, there's a potential draw for dollar to get up to here. I'm not stating unequivocally that it's going to go there. I'm watching to see throughout this week, do we see signs that it wants to continuously press up into this area? If it does, that means we have potential, not a guarantee, potential for lower prices in Forex, stocks, and stock averages. So that's where my focus is today. I want to see, do we get more indications that that's probable? Or are we going to hit this fair value gap complete closure here? And let me draw this out so you can see. So we have just a little bit left in there. And I want to watch and see, do we get a reaction and start to sell off a little bit? And if we do sell off, how far can it go? Uh, we have a breaker here. We have a low, high, lower low. So that up close candle in here, it can trade down as far as that, which would be around the 102.30 to 
255 ish those two specific price levels so that's what i'm looking for for dollar and the relationships between what levels and why i expect to see either one potentially drawn to i, I don't have a right now this is what's going to do we haven't seen a whole lot of movement overnight we don't really have any heavy news we have an 8 30 some kind of uh weak report in, in terms of in my opinion uh, but we could get a little bit of movement in about 11 minutes real quickly i want to just touch on euro all right so euro mentioned also at the beginning of the year that we were going to draw up into these relative equal highs for the buy side and if it gets above that we could trade up into this fair value gap again go go back and watch the videos the body's respected perfectly look at that close and the open on this candle and after running up into that SIBI it's a fair value gap by classification but specifically it's a sell side imbalance buy side inefficiency meaning that it only delivered price on the downside so how does the market algorithmically rebalance and reprice this range it has to do what deliver it on the upside so it trades up into it offers that buy side that was inefficient over here and then we have the market displace lower so we took out a short-term swing low here i like the idea of that uh, we traded down into a buy side imbalance sell side efficiency here so this is a fair value gap too this the singular candle and we could dig down a little bit further just like we mentioned on the dollar it has a little bit more upside to fill in its gap it doesn't mean much in terms of opportunity it just means that's where my focus is just because we're sitting in front of the charts and we have time to be in front of the charts and the markets are trading doesn't mean oh i got time the charts are printing candlestick so therefore let's take a trade that's gambling so there has to be something for me to, to lean on logically to frame a condition that would be hopefully high probability i only want to encourage you to focus on those types of opportunities there's plenty there's a plethora of opportunities intraday that are not really good risk well framed with real good risk reward models not that i'm a big fan of risk to reward because i think it's a fallacy uh, you don't know if your trade's going to pan out that much and you don't know if your stop loss is going to get hit so no one knows that so you might look to trade with a specific risk model five to one ten to one three to one but going into this industry thinking that you're always going to get what you're setting your trade up for is a fallacy you have no control once you enter the marketplace so i'm going to be teaching you hopefully to ferret out these opportunities where price action can deliver with the highest degree of probability reaching from one level to the next notice i didn't say i'm going to put you in winning trades that's a that's a stark contrast to what i'm trying to do here i'm trying to teach you how to read price if you're here to try to like you know keep score or something like that that's not what this is i have other live streams that i'll do things that I'll, I'll i'll showcase stuff here it's lectures teaching getting down to the brass tacks of what you're supposed to be doing before you even press a demo account using the things i'm teaching on my channel okay so that way hopefully i've communicated that clearly it's not meant for you to follow along and press a live trade don't try to trade your funded account with the things i'm going to say today and any future live stream okay it's very important that you understand that today also marks the day where i'm not re i'm not replying or hearting or liking any post on twitter it is now just a medium for me to alert you if there's something that's got my attention and i'm not live streaming i'm going to bring something to your attention there i don't care to know what your responses are i don't care if you like it i don't care if you don't like it don't communicate to me through it because i'm not reading any of it my attention is dialed in the, the markets for now and between now and the second friday of november it's all work no play cable real quick we'll just take a quick look at this one this one was unable to make a higher high before i transition to cable look at the higher highs being posted here up into its fair value gap for euro over here and then, then look at cable weak really really weak so we had this imbalance here i wanted to see it run above take buy side it failed to do so it looks likely that we'll get down into this sell side here if we accelerate through this be mindful that we have this area over here, which since cables already posted weakness comparatively to the euro, 
Um, if one were to consider if we see acceleration on the upside for dollar, again, that's risk off. Higher dollar is lower prices for foreign currencies and lower, likely lower for stock indices, equities, and index futures. So if we take out this low, it could, if dollar accelerates to the upside, we could see cable draw down into this imbalance here. All right, so that's about it for Forex. Let's go on over to ES. A second here. <clears throat> All right, so we have the upper left hand corner chart that is the hourly chart, the lower left hand corner is the 15 minute time frame, and the one minute chart, which will change throughout the, the live sessions. I'll toggle this particular chart from five minute, four minute, three minute, two minute, one. Okay. And I'm pretty much mimicking what I have static in front of me. When you watch the uh, little stinger video I put up on my Twitter this morning, you've probably already seen it. It's my trading real estate. I have eight monitors in front of me. And one of the screens itself has a one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute for NASDAQ and the ES. Since I'm using those two markets primarily if I'm trading index futures, I don't trade the Dow, even though you will see the Dow flash, you know, when it's necessary to be mentioning it. I don't trade the Dow and that's just trying to discourage you from trading. If you've been successful with it, if you like that medium, by all means, stick to it. Don't let me or anyone else take you out of what you're trying to do or what to do. Okay. All I'm trying to do is inspire you to read price from a classical point of view without indicators completely naked nothing in here you know like this little red line down here that's not an indicator all that is is the nasdaq it's the price on let me get this here it's a line chart and the way you get that how you get that let me just take it off and i'll let you see how you, how we do it we got a couple minutes still take 30. you go up to your little plus symbol here on trading view you click on that be mindful that you're looking at the uh, chart that you're not going to load back up. In other words, I'm plotting S&P. So ES is the chart, so I want to compare it to NASDAQ. So you would do the same thing here. You would type out the front month code for the index that you want to compare it to. You can do this with, with the Dow, too. Like if you wanted to put the Dow up, you put YMH for the month code for November. I'm sorry, for March. November, good grief. 2023. Okay, and if I did that, it's plotting it over top. You don't want that. So you untoggle it and click on new pane and it'll plot it down here. Now, if you want to add the NASDAQ in addition to, you can put NQH2023. Now, when a March contract expires, you would change the H to M for the delivery month of June. Okay, and then you plot that. And then again, it's plotting over top of it. You don't want to do that. You want to go to new pane. All right. And then what you would do is if you want to compare, like if you're looking for uh, market breadth to continue working lower, you would be comparing the highs. So you would click on the toggle box here on your price source. You would go to high. Okay. And then here for the NASDAQ, same thing. You would go to high. And what that's doing is it's plotting. I don't like the light blue color. It's plotting the relationship of all of the highs. So you can comparatively study the difference in relationships between all the price highs that of ES, that's the trading market. That's, I'm trading that market, but I'm looking at the relationships between how the market has priced in specific highs and lows relative to the Dow, which is the only real use for me as a trader. I don't trade the Dow. And then you have the NASDAQ. So I'm looking at the relationships between highs 
in one pair, oh, not one pair, but in one market versus the other. And what do I mean by it? What's the, what's the benefit of doing something like this? If you look at the relationship of these highs here on NASDAQ with that of Dow and then the E-mini S&P. So you can see that the S&P looked stronger here and it was relatively speaking, but it was just running up into take stops. And how do you know it's a stop run? when you start seeing weakness across the averages like this. And this is simply just Dow theory. And I like to look at that to confirm market breadth. Does the market offer the likelihood of a continued price move higher or lower? Okay. And about 25 seconds or so, we have some news coming in. It's not terribly exciting in my opinion, but you know, we'll watch and see. But that's how you add those things. They're not indicators. That's not an oscillator. It's nothing. You know, I don't use indicators. Okay, but I'm looking at the relationships between the averages, and that'll help me many times ferret out an idea, or at least that's the plan, right? Uh, you might be looking at these levels over here, asking what they are. That is the new week opening gap, high and low. Uh, let me maximize this real quick. On Sunday's opening, as soon as the market opens, the only thing I do anymore, I used to trade Sundays, but I don't trade them anymore. Uh, the only thing I'm interested in doing on Sunday is seeing where we open. So here's the opening price on Sunday. And you want to do that. Uh oh, I'm not sure you guys can still hear me or not. It sounded like this headset just powered down. And it's a brand new one, so I don't know. I don't know if it's picking up the audio. Give me a second here. Yeah, you should be still hearing me, so we'll stick with it. Okay. And on a 15-minute time frame, the opening price on Sunday, you annotate that, and then you have the closing price on Friday. So that range is your new week opening gap. I just want to make sure I can hear myself. And if I can hear myself, you should be fine. Hold on one second. All right. I apologize if the video audio goes to lower degree of... Uh, volume but i don't know how to fix this headset just purchased so <laughs> we'll just have to work with this until i can overcome that we can still be you can still hear me so this gap this new week opening gap it has been taught by me multiple times uh, throughout the years that this is like a real strong price magnet the market's going to want to gravitate back to it if we're not trending Okay, and this is the part where if you're watching and you don't have a notepad or your journaling is not being utilized here, you're wasting your time watching this because these are things that repeat. If the market's going to be consolidating or not in a trending environment, the opening gap on Sunday, if you extend it through all the way through Friday, you're going to see many times the price will gravitate back to it. Sometimes it'll go into halfway. Sometimes it'll go completely through it. It'll act as real support and resistance. The, the way you expect classic support and resistance to work, like you see in the books, these two price levels and the middle of it. What is the middle? You just take your fib, apply it on the opening price on Sunday, and you apply it to the closing price on Friday. That range is extremely sensitive especially with the low the high and the midpoint so the midpoint level would be 41.40 and a quarter and you can draw some distinctions the way you would want to do it i'm just showing it like this is one way of doing it so that we can differentiate what what it is 
You can make them very bold. And I, I keep mine like like a, a black color, which is in indirectly you know, something standing out in my chart. Whereas usually I'll have like a blue line or a red line for like liquidity pool. Uh, this way it's drawing a heavy distinction between what a level might be on a lower time frame. I know that that big, heavy, thick black line is rooted on something higher time frame and or in this case, it's the new week opening gap. You can see how we've already traded up to it here. It bumped it here, failed to go here, went lower, worked it here, just fell short of it there, tried several times here, and failed right here. So we haven't really probed anything above meaningfully the consequent encroachment, which again, consequent encroachment is half of a gap or any inefficiency, such as this level is here. We haven't worked really anything up into this area here. So there's a little bit of price action that has not closed in or offered buy side here. So even if we do go lower, take out this low, which is in my mind likely this morning. We could go down here, reject, and make an attempt to go up here if we get that weakness in a dollar. So if the dollar does trade lower, that would offer an opportunity for the market to want to trade back up into this new week opening gap, which is these specific price levels. Now, think about what it is stated there. I'm not teaching supply and demand. I don't believe in supply and demand. Unless we're talking about commodities, which are really directly linked to a real supply and demand factor because it's a real, it's a real market. Not to say that you can't make money in this market. It's not a real market. Not in the same sense that a bushel of wheat or gold, that's something real. Okay, the value of a stock indice is not the same as something that you can eat. You know, this could theoretically go to zero. Highly unlikely, but it theoretically could go to zero. Gold's not going to zero. Wheat's not going to zero. You know, cattle. You know, beef prices, pork. You know, crude oil. It's not going to zero. So there's real supply and demand factors with those markets. But when we look at markets like this, this in many ways I view them as synthetic. Uh, they don't have the same measure of supply and demand, but it is manipulated and engineered. So the interest is always constantly manipulated. So what I do and what I teach my students to do is look for areas and markets where the manipulation is obvious or it's expected. And then we look for setups that repeat using phenomenon based on markets trading to liquidity buy side liquidity which is above a high or relative equal highs that can be an entry to a new trade or it could be a closing target for an existing trade don't think that it's that you know that is the only approach for your trade as it's a target only no i can use it as an entry too as you'll learn this year as well i want to focus primarily on what I taught last year, uh, that model, the 2022 model, but I can't promise that I won't stray off topic when it doesn't materialize. So because I'm in front of you live, I, I want to get you thinking about things beyond that model. So that way for those individuals, not that all of you should be, but for those individuals that are already outgrowing that model, because you've now used it, you're making money with your funded account, maybe live funds and you're learning. You want to do something more and broaden your horizons in terms of price action. I'll show and do more of that stuff this year. But also it's just beneficial for you to just simply because I might not trade a specific price swing doesn't mean that I can't see it or you may not steer away from it. It may be the very pattern that you're going to focus in on. So I'm trying to be the mentor that allows you to bring your own. I'm going to maximize this now. So all of this is going to disappear. And it's it's not important that it stays up. I just want to make sure I showed you how I did that compare. All right, so now think about what has happened here. We have a five minute chart. Now we have liquidity down here. Let me get this out of the way, sorry. 
So at this low and just below it, I teach my students, we aim for that. I don't look at that as it's going to go down here and bounce. I, I don't ever look at it like that. I look at price like who went long here? I don't, I don't know. You don't know. We don't care. Somebody went long. The market went higher. So below that low, classical technical analysis is going to do what? Preach that you have to put your stop loss rate at that low or just below it, right? So what kind of stop is going to be there? A sell stop, which is why I teach that that is sell side liquidity. Price rallies up, it breaks down. What just happened right here? Right below this low, it shifts. Market where? Bullish or bearish? Bearish. So what we do is we look inside this price leg here and we look for any inefficiency. So once this leg here has been broken on that candle, that one right there, that's where you enter with the expectation of finding the setup that I taught in the 2022 model. This is exactly what you would expect to see. Now, why is that? Because you're seeing, number one, buy side taken. See these relative equal highs over here? Above this area, anywhere in your price, anywhere in your chart, I don't care what market you trade, it doesn't matter. It's it, This is like a constant thing that repeats over and over and over again. Watch this volume and balance in here, by the way, because it could see that and drop down and below there. But buy side liquidity here, above old highs, when the market's dropping, Like it does here if anyone went short there where would they place their stop theoretically to protect themselves the books teach us what put your stop loss at the high or just above it so the market drops down rallies from here and all of this area here that's absorbing and engaging all the buy side liquidity or buy stops that will be resting above these relative equal highs so that's that's what's occurring here so when i teach my students and how i internalize price when I see that, I'm expecting price to do what? Show a willingness to want to go lower. Because it went up here for real orders. I don't need level two. You don't need level two. You don't need depth of market to see that. It's, it's, it's plain. Wherever there are smooth edges, like these relative equal highs like this, the market, it's uncanny how it will go up there and make those smooth edges jagged. So it's all nice and smooth here, like a, like a perfect ceiling, right? And then all of a sudden you see this smash running up, spend some time up here, and then breaks lower. This moment right here, when it takes out these lows and that candle, that is the market model that I gave you for 2022. Doesn't mean you get in. It means now you look at this price leg here. Go back through this price leg because this is the displacement price leg. This low has been taken out right there. So inside this entire run lower, you want to look at where there is an inefficiency or a fair value gap. That fair value gap is your entry point. You just don't chase it just because it went down below here. Many times I see a lot of YouTubers, they're breakout traders. You know, they might make money. But I promise if you spend a little bit of time what I'm going to teach you this year, you will enter shorts when the market's going up. And it seems scary. It seems like I don't want to do that. That's terrifying. How do you know? Well, number one, you know because you practice it. You do it over and over and over again. And by doing it over and over and over again, it desensitizes you too. Because in the beginning, you want to be correct. That's, that's really, you didn't get into this business to be right, because if you wanted to be right, you would play board games and play chess, okay? <laughs> Those types of things. I, I, I was right about these moves and these outcomes, and that, that was the reward for it. In the markets, you want to be profitable and control and manage risk. You don't want to do anything but that. That's the number one factor for why you're doing something. But in the beginning, that, that lure into the marketplace while you're doing it, changes and morphs into 
I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. Because ego, pride, um, just, I guess, the uh, inability to embrace uncertainty creates fear. And somehow we as humans encapsulate that one transaction, that one idea that in many ways is insignificant. One trade is insignificant. But in the beginning, you make that singular trade or a singular trade paramount. Like it's the only thing that defines you as a profitable trader. And that is unfortunately something that is normal. It happens to everyone. I went through it. Everyone else that's still trading you know, profitably, no matter how long they've been doing it, they can sit there and they're nodding their head right now listening to me. Like, yeah, it's, it's, that happens. Everybody goes through that. The problem is you want it to be black and white, perfect. You know when it only works and you know when it doesn't work. So therefore, you're thinking that there's a way for me and you and everyone else out there to never take the losing trade. And that doesn't exist. That does not exist. So you have to look at the probabilities of something repeating that we can look back in time and say, okay, it usually does this, it usually does that, and therefore I've seen a hundred sample sizes of this particular thing happening under these uh, circumstances, you know, the things that lead up to it. And what does that mean? Well, as I mentioned, we had relative equal highs. The market runs up in here. We don't do anything. We're waiting. Then the market drops. It does so here. Do we do anything with that? No. The market rallies again. What does it do? It runs above the rejection block in here. It's in my YouTube channel. And then there's a displacement lower. So this willingness to break sharply below a swing low after, after taking buy side. This is how you frame high probability. High probability for a short means some measure of buy side has been taken. We see that here. Then you wait for what? Displacement. That means in plain terms, you want to see the market drop sharply lower and take out a specific low. Here's a short term low. It trades through it here. Once we have that, then we can go back through all this price like here and look for inefficiencies. That means a specific fair value gap. Now, once you have that price leg identified, you want to go through all your time frames. Five, four, three, two, one. Right now, I'm showing you on a five minute chart. So we have this price leg from high to low. High to low. This is the low that was shown as a break in market structure, and not break, I shouldn't say it that way, a shift in market structure. So anything at this level or higher, we want to look at that as a potential what? Fair value gap. Now, this is the part that being mentored versus just watching one of my videos or listening to someone else try to take a, a series of lectures or a video of mine that may be an hour or so long and they try to condense it to a five minute trainer. Learn ICT stuff in five minutes. You're never going to learn what I'm about to show you in those five minute trainer versions. Okay. I understand everybody wants to get clicks on their videos and such, but if you want to learn, you get, there's a way of doing it correctly and there's a way of just looking at cliff notes. It didn't work for you in school when you studied the cliff notes and you didn't get a high score. You have to read the book, right? Okay. So here's what it is. Inside this run from the midpoint of this leg higher and lower. Okay, that's the, that's the price leg that we're looking at. Why this price leg? Because it took out this short-term low on that candle. It's a shift in market structure, bearish, lower prices are expected. We do not look at any rally up as a sustainable run. Why? Because stops have already been taken above this high here. Then there's a shift in market structure below that low. That means that any rally prior, I'm sorry, not prior, but after you know establishing the midpoint here, once it goes above that, in my mind, I'm thinking we're only going up to go down. So algorithmically, the market will pre print and produce a premium market. A premium market is where you want to sell 
your long positions in, as partials or enter your short positions. When the market's rallying, that's where you want to short. You don't want to sell in down candles. That's chasing price. When you see me doing my partials, well not my partial, when I'm pyramiding into a position, I'm, I'm selling short in the up candle. And then I'm adding more as the candles are going up into that move. I'm not fearful of that. When I first started, I was absolutely afraid of that. I was scared. I was afraid what I was buying was a rocket. And I didn't want to get stung. I didn't, get, I didn't want to get hurt. More specifically, I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't care about the money. I didn't want to be wrong. I wanted to be right. And being right is not essential to profitability. It sounds like it's a it's an impossibility because you can be you can be right and lose money. You can be wrong and make money. So you have to do many times what seems like is the most proper way of doing it. Most uh, intuitive thing is most, most of the time not the correct thing to do in trading. When the market's been going down, everybody thinks, well, well it's, it's, it's going down, so let me get short. They chase it. And I was a victim of that when I first started. So that's the reason why I teach the PD array matrix. So that way you can frame a price leg as we're doing here, the high to that low. Why am I specifically aiming for this price leg? Why am I only looking at this one? And why am I looking at this one? Because this one here didn't do any kind of a short term price run where it created a swing low like this one does here. It rallies up and then it overlaps that entire run and breaks it there on that candle. Once that occurs, as soon as that happens, I'm waiting for price to make a turn and start going back up. Well, what happens here? ICT didn't go above the equilibrium price went here. No, because this level isn't the equilibrium until this low. So if we were looking at this here, did that, did that trade meaningfully above the 50% level? No. And even if it poked its head above that, did it trade to a fair value gap that would be inside that price leg from here to here? No. So look closer. You have this price run down. We're waiting for price to go back above equilibrium, which is the 50% level on your FIB. That's there's no mystery to it, okay? This is this is the only benefit of having a Fibonacci in my mind. That and how I use it for targeting. And I'll show you that stuff. And you've probably already seen many times me doing it in my live executions and managing the position, trailing the stop, looking for targets to be hit and such. But this run above equilibrium within this price leg here, that sets the stage. Okay, now we are in a premium market, meaning this range is premium. It's, in other words, overbought. I don't need an indicator. You don't need an indicator to, to arrive that. From this point here to here, this is discount. As soon as we leave, and again, this is, again, not in the folks that try to teach my stuff. They don't know what they're doing, and I'm asking you Please stop trying to teach my stuff because you don't know what you're doing. You're not covering things that are most salient and you're oblivious to the things that are necessary for certain things to be really in the marketplace. This discount okay, in the red shaded area above this level here, that's a premium. Above it or at that level, they're your ideal shorts. As soon as you cross the midpoint of the discount level here, once we get through that, Did that by eyeball. That was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> Once you get through that, there, the highest form of profitable 
shorts, the highest probability short entries, they have now been exhausted. The only thing you want to be focusing on now is taking partials and trailing your stop. <gasps> yes, that's a diamond. You just simply can't just take every single trade and enter and enter and enter and enter. When do I stop taking partials or pyramiding? Something like this. Now I'll build pyramiding entries all in this until we get through here. And then I stop taking pyramid entries. Go back and look at my examples and you'll see that's the truth. So when I wanted to learn how to pyramid and build my positions large, I learned it incorrectly from Ken Roberts rag of a book, you know, the world's most powerful money manual and course. <laughs> it's a long title for something that was useless like toilet paper, but I guess the toilet paper is useful, but use toilet paper. Let's put it that way. The, uh, the idea of looking for the best entry points, the highest probability and how the market will respect those levels more so than others. See, we, once we leave the midpoint of that, discount range of this price run here to here and we're in the lower portion of it we're entering that expansion phase that expansion phase is likely to not offer very many if at all new high probability pyramid entries to it to add to a position so there's a threshold at which i will no longer add to new existing positions but while i'm on that premium area within that price leg, within the market structure that I'm looking for, as I just outlined here, and again, you're going to want to watch this portion of the, the video several times. It gives you the highest degree of probability for delivery from your entry to your targets. And you don't want to chase the move and build in more position once it breaks through the threshold I just outlined here. Because to do so, number one, you're going to be worrying about trying to put on another position versus taking off some as it moves in your favor. It's crucial in the beginning for you to do those types of things. Now, for someone that's seasoned, they've been around for a long time. You know what you're doing. You know how to profit. You know how to look at targets. Your targets are not unrealistic. And you can go to full terminus. That means your full target, where you aimed for when you first got on the trade. In the beginning, and this is who I'm talking to right now when I'm doing these live streams and I'm talking to the students that are here listening. I'm not talking to the guy that's been doing it for five years and he's funded and he's got you know profitability. You can glean what you want to glean from what I'm teaching. But it's the folks that are brand new. They have no idea where to go. They have no idea what to do with this information, how to use it, how to frame the logic. What rules do you follow? What do I do? What do I don't do? That's what I'm trying to accomplish with these lectures and obviously with the live streams. So once the market starts to draw back up into this premium area, we have to go through our time frames and look for fair value gaps. So right away we have this low to high. Let's go back in with the FIB. So we have to go into a fair value gap at or above equilibrium. So from this point on up, we can look for what? A fair value gap. Is this a fair value gap? Yes. What if you sold short there? Would it be profitable? Yes. Where would your stop need to be? Here it needs to be at the high. That's a lot. That's a lot of that's a lot of range. But I don't want to have a stop loss like that. Okay, but you're gonna to have to be more selective with your entries then. Now look closer. Inside this price leg here, this is why I'm not supply and demand also. What is this? What's that? What's the separation between this candle's close and this candle's opening? Volume imbalance. The volume imbalance has no body between two close and or opening prices. So it can be a volume imbalance between a higher close and a lower opening, or it could be a difference between a close with a higher opening. That's the difference between the two potential volume imbalances. The wicks overlap. See how it has a small little wick right here? Let me see if I can... How can I do that here? I know there's probably a shortcut to do this and you guys are saying, if you would just do this ICT. <laughs> 
there's a small little wick here and a small little wick right here. Whenever I'm looking at price, I'm looking for those types of things because that's a signature. That's a little that's a little uh, glitch in the matrix. Think of it like that. So if you take that. And draw it through because we cut through candles, Sam. We're not supplying demand around here. If you cut through all this drop as it's retracing back up, what's it reaching for? It is reaching for an imbalance in here. Yes, there's one here with this candle. There's one here between this candle low and this candle's high. And then we have one here to here specifically with that candle. Which one is better? Yes, you can enter here and have a stop loss up here. But look closer. In this delivery higher, when it ran higher, what is this last up close candle anyway? It's a bearish order block. Why is it a bearish order block? Because it has a fair value gap. Opening price on this candle is what? You're going to look right here. Opening price on this candle is 4130.00. Okay. What's the high on this candle here? You're looking right here. The high of that candle is 4130.00. You cannot improve on perfection. That's algorithmic. What's the high on the next candle here? 4130.00. Again, not one tick off, not one tick over, not one tick short. So if you have a series of fair value gaps, which one do you look to trade to or use your entry app? Look for the bearish order block. Look for a volume imbalance or a fair value gap on the other side of the drop. You extend it through. Again, we cut through candles. You can't... I'm trying to... I'm not trying to be so dogmatic in the live streams and I'm trying to control myself because I will literally go into a Twitter rant and just not be as productive as I'm trying to be. There's certain things you have to look for and I can't teach you every possible scenario that's available in the future because it's better to see it live, explaining it live. Now you're looking at this and saying, well, that's not, that's not live. It already happened. I understand that, but I'm showing you the logic that one would use to get to the delivery on this setup, which is exactly out of the 2022 model that was shown to you last year. So with that volume imbalance and the fact that it's above equilibrium on that price leg right here. So the first one you can come to, you, you could go short there and your risk would be to that high. Trading at this one with the volume imbalance and the fair value gap and now watch. What's the half of this up close candle? Remember what that was? What's the half of an order block? It's not consequent encouragement. Consequent encouragement is any inefficiency. A fair value gap, buy side of balance, sell side efficiency. Those are consequent encouragement midpoints. A candle, a range, a specific candle that's been delivered in price, the midpoint of that is mean threshold. Low to high is 41.31 and a half. So if you were taking this fair value gap, joining it with the volume imbalance, and it's a bearish order block, price should not do what? It should not trade above the midpoint of that up close candle. So your stock could be at 41.32. 41.32. So that means you have a two handle or two point stop loss entering within this volume imbalance, within this fair value gap, And if some of you are new, you have no idea that this stuff is repeating like this. And I, I walked you through an example, something like this in the stock indices last week. I said, you know, I, use, I wanted to use a fair value gap for a resistance level. And it stopped dead in its tracks just like this did, did here. And I executed on it and I showed it to you. So it's not cherry picking. It's not you know, looking at hindsight only. You have to study hindsight. 
every trader that's making money right now that's profitable, they learned by studying hindsight. You have to understand what the concept looks like. You have to identify it. And that way by seeing it, like when you go out and you learn how to hunt and track you know, your prey, you spend a lot of time looking at tracks. Oh, this is a bear. This is a elk. This is a deer. And that's the only way you can identify what it looks like because you have to see it in, in the history. Where has it been shown before? But once you understand the basics of the pattern, the setups, the, the primary framework, then it must be studied on real-time data. And it doesn't mean studying by pushing a demo account or studying with a live account. You do not learn anything correctly by doing that. There's a step in between that everybody skips over because they're in a hurry to be profitable versus I want to take my time and be systematic. I want to know that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and avoiding the things and not being influenced emotionally and psychologically because of the money. Because as soon as you put a trade on, you're worrying about the P&L of that trade. You're not worrying about the price action. Your mind shifts from managing the risk and managing the trade versus now I hope I don't lose. Is this thing going to turn around and go after my stop? And it may not even be close to your stop, but most of the time it will because you're in a hurry to do what? Jam your stop loss up. And that's not what a profitable trader does. Profitable traders aren't in a hurry to race their stop loss to break even. They're not, they're not concerned about that. Why? Because they've been here before. They know that even if this trade fails, it's not going to end their career. It doesn't undo the the efficacy of their model or their approach to trading. It just means that that was one human transaction that they made. They placed risk behind it and it was wrong and it didn't deliver a favorable outcome, but you can still learn from that. And it doesn't unsettle you as a profitable trader that you don't, you don't say, I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to change my approach to trading because I had a losing trade. Now in the beginning, that's exactly what you're going to want to do. As soon as you try to learn from me or learn from someone else and you suffer a losing trade, the first thing you're thinking is, okay, this doesn't work. Let me go to something else. And I did that. I did that for years. And I had a winning model, but I kept tinkering around with it until I realized I was holding myself back. So that's how we go through the process of looking for the right fair value gap. Now, if there's no... A volume of balance or if there's no fair value gap here on the other side of the displacement leg then I'll use the first fair value gap above the equilibrium and then there it is now another version of this would be using this and I usually do this if I'm going to be building a large position like if I know I'm going to be building a large pyramided position up I'll use this run up where it takes Right before it drops down and takes a shift in market structure. So this is the displacement leg. Okay, This leg here, you split that in half. You would use any fair value got, I'm sorry, any fair value got at this level. And here's your cell side. Look at what we just talked about there. Let me finish this thought here and then I'm going to talk about this volume imbalance I mentioned. This leg here to here. If we had no volume imbalance, if that wasn't there, I would take this low to that high, the equilibrium there, drag that through, this would be the fair value gap at that moment. So and then I would be doing this. Again, this is assuming that there's no volume imbalance. My entry would be here and framed on this fair value gap there. Show me how to pick the right fair value gap. I just did. Did you write it down? Did you record it in your blog? Did you journal it? No. You're watching it like Netflix and you're going to never learn. So there's the there's the logic, okay? And there's the sell side. Now, let me take your attention right back down into here because I told you, watch this volume imbalance. You know, one of those cherry picking events. If you go over here, the separation between the candle's close and the candle's opening, you want to get real used to doing that in your charts. When you see that, your eye's going to jump to it. Do you see it here? See that right there? That's a volume imbalance. That's a glitch in the matrix. OK, 
Okay, they're coded. They're there for a reason. Right there. See it? Just like it was here. And there's one here. And there's one right there. So when I look at price, my eyes jump to fair value gaps, swing highs, swing lows, volume imbalances. That's that's just where my eye goes. Okay. Here, think about what I was talking about before we drop down into the sell side. I said, watch this when it was trading up until here. So watch this volume imbalance. From this point here to that low, what is that? It's a PD array. It's an area where you expect price to react. React how? I framed all this here, but before I went on all the business up here, I said, watch that low. I believe we're going down below that. Now, I already know some of you skeptics, I mean, skeptics in the audience are sitting here thinking, well, big deal. You know, it was this big run. I have hundreds of trades where I'm doing 100 handles or more. You can use the same logic to do those trades too. I am teaching you this year how to do a five handle run as a starting point. That is not to say that your entire career must only be on the basis of a five handle price move. It's to get someone that has never traded a low hanging fruit objective. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because if anybody in here that's an educator or teacher, they have a first threshold objective, something that they teach their students to aim for. I'm just electing to say, Five handles in the S&P market, when you're paper trading and you're demo trading and you're tape reading, if you're looking for that, number one, if that's all you ever get to be consistent with, that's enough. It's, it's absolutely enough. You can take that same little cookie cutter approach of five handles and put money management behind that. Money management behind something that is effective could produce many, many five handle moves over and over and over again and it compounds and you, you use the power of compound interest to do the heavy lifting through money management you're not risking more you would be I guess risking more comparatively from where you first started as your, as your equity base when you first start trading versus five years into trading your risk isn't any larger percentage wise it's a fixed rate of percentage risk that increases monetarily but never percentage wise so the heavy lifting is done by money management not the bigger positions coming in I can do that I can do heavy-handed trades but a learning student first introduction to trading first introduction to what I'm trying to teach it would not be efficient for me as a mentor to try to waste my time trying to build you up to try to do these big heavy handed trades in the beginning when you don't even know how to read price. So the way you learn how to read price and you feel rewarded because it's more frequent that you'll see a five handle move than a hundred handle move. There's many five handle runs intraday versus how many one hand, 100 handle runs is happening intraday in one sustained run. It's not happening that often, right? So by framing the logic like this, this is where the stops are. What kind of stops? They're sell stops. So that makes it sell side liquidity. The market's going down up here. So where would it go? Down to here. Why? Because smart money and the algorithms that are in the marketplace, they engage these levels here. So what's above that? Buy side liquidity. In short, it's what? Buy stops. So what happens is the buy stops get tripped in here. Smart money traders like myself and who I'm teaching my students to be, they will accumulate short positions against these buy stops with the expectation that they will ride price lower to, the, to this low. Why is that advantageous? Because below this low is sell side liquidity for anyone that has been long here and wrote it up. I'm not saying that there aren't traders up here 
trading without a stop loss or trailing their stop loss up tight and head then already knocked out. That's not what I'm saying. Algorithmically, the market will remember and refer back to that low. It does not know how many stops are actually below the low. It doesn't need to know that. It just needs to reprice at that level. Then the people that are in the marketplace, quote unquote, smart money, the composite man, they will use that liquidity as a counter to their shorting against the buy stops up here. So basically it's the game of tag, tag, you're it. Buy stops are it. Okay, so now who's next? Sell side, tag, you're it down here. So in essence, smart money sells to buy stops with the expectation that they're going to run lower in price and then buy sell stops. Now, you don't learn that in books. You think buy down here support, sell up here resistance. And I take my students' understanding about the marketplace and turn it upside down. Because inside the upside down is the clarity that you're looking for. The frustration is immediately removed. So now let's go back. The volume and bounce I mentioned live before it actually delivered to you. Inside this area, if, if we hadn't already moved so far away here, I would use as an entry. Why wouldn't you take that as an entry? If you knew and you said it was a volume and balance cycle, you said there was a sell side liquidity, you said it was going to likely go down there. Why didn't you take this as a trade? Why wouldn't I take that as a trade? Because of what I've outlined up here in reference to the premium and discount range. Once we leave, if we're bearish, once we break through the midpoint of discount, I cannot take another new entry. You can. I'm not. I'm managing now. I'm managing my core position. That's it. It's over. This becomes a point of interest where I'm going to see the trade be managed with it. I am not going to put my stop loss below that volume and balance. I'm not going to trail it down there. If I see that volume and balance, as I mentioned real time, said watch that area. My stock could be above this high. It could be at the middle of this up close candle mean threshold because it shouldn't go there. Why? Because I'm expecting this volume and balance, this keep price from wanting to rally all that. Why? Why would I expect that? You see this opening here? We rally up. We drop down. All of this range between from the low and the high, that range has already been delivered to this low. So 41.18. The next candle here, we open, we drop down, and we roll right back over top of 41.18. So we had one, two times. Between this candle's high and this candle's low, this entire range Oh, you're learning today. School is in session with ICT. <laughs> so inside that range, this is now balanced because we've had delivery to the downside. We came off of it. We went down through it again, and then we left what? A volume imbalance. So it's highly, highly unlikely that the market's going to do what? Think. What do you see in here? I've been, re I've been recently teaching a lot about it. That low to that high. What's that price? It's consequent encroachment. Wait a minute. You said that's for gaps and fair value gaps. Yes. A wick is a gap. To an algorithm, they view a wick as a gap. Midpoint of that is consequent encroachment. What price is that? 41.19 and a quarter. So my stop would have to be above that. Trusting that it would not go above that. That's stop management. That's how you understand what you're looking for. And we got about uh, 11 minutes almost before the market opens up. So in this area here, that volume and bounce will simply just be a measure of me managing a position that's open until we get down to here and where we can take partials. Okay. I just want to have a second to go back over to... Um, the dollar index. Just give me a second, please. Um, OK. 
Okay, yeah, see how we went into this area here? I mentioned that that small little portion of price went right up into it there. So now this is important because we have technically fulfilled the repricing of this down close candle. So this SIBI, which is a fair value gap, sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. It offered the range on the downside. So to reprice that, there's going to be delivery on the upside, which is what we have here. But now because we've hit that, and we're going into what? The opening in New York at 930. We have to demand a whole lot from price action because it's already delivered enough to cause us to go into consolidation. We don't know with any great degree of certainty now if it's going to rally higher or if it's going to decline lower. So how would I use that on a day like today? I would probably trade specifically the afternoon session. I would let the street money wrestle with the strong money, smart money, in the morning session. It doesn't mean I'm going to turn off the live stream. It just means that I'm not likely to see a setup because of this condition here. We've arrived at a level I mentioned that would be likely possible, but it doesn't really give us much. It did offer what? Weaker S&P. Did we have weaker S&P? Did you see a signal form? No. Did you see me outline a signature in price that should offer what? Response in price. The bias is what? On S&P, lower. Where was it likely to go to from this volume imbalance? To this low and underneath it. Why? Because everything I've outlined here. Did it move five handles? From 41.18 to 41.13, is that not five handles? You want to screenshot this. You want to save this. And in all these open areas in your chart, if you're screenshotting mine, you want to fill this up with things that you have observed, which you've heard me say today. Because chances are, I'm probably not going to remember everything I said and add it to the annotations I'm using. Because I'll, I'll save these charts and log them on my TradingView profile. Um, I don't know how I don't know how to share them, so I'll have to figure that out later tonight. But um, I think if you follow me on TradingView, you should be able to see anything I publish. I'm assuming I don't know for certain, so please don't hold me to that. So that's model 2022, last year's uh, teaching right here in price action, and the logic of how to know that the market's likely to be bearish or, or bullish. I've walked you through that this morning. How do you get a bias? How do you look for risk on, risk off? Real quick in your notes, risk on is when the dollar's dropping or likely to go lower. That means that you have foreign currency likely to go higher in that instance. Uh, you have stocks that are likely to go higher and then the index futures are likely to go higher. If you have risk on, uh, I just got confused here. Let me, let me say it again without all the mumbo jumbo. Dollar lower allows S&P and Forex to go higher. Dollar higher puts pressure on S&P stocks, index futures, and Forex, and it's likely to see them go lower. So it's like a teeter-totter. If dollar's up or going up or likely to go up, that means it's risk off. All other assets are likely to go lower or have difficulty going higher. If dollars going lower, that means it's going to be easy for buy signals in S&P and in futures and or Forex to go higher. So if we look at the, let's see here, I'll chart them on. If we look at the uh, euro real quick, remember we were digging down deeper into that. If we look at the five minute chart on euro, fair value gap, softer. Let's so look at cable real quick. I know I can hear the guys that's been trading for a while. Dude, I know this. I understand you might know it. There's a lot of people that are here that don't. Cables is ugly. We did have softer, but there's nothing here I would have traded on. 
In fact, I probably would have been stopped out with this run here. Yeah, I would have been. I would have used this right here. I would have went short on that one, and my stop would have been hit there. So there's some reality for you. And look at gold real quick. Remember what I said last week about gold? It was a pretty wild drop, wasn't it? Uh, watch this level here on this order block right there. That might be a level to watch. If we break through the middle of this candle here, so you do your own mean threshold measurement there. If we break through that on the downside, on a closing basis, uh, we're going into this area here with the sell side. Otherwise, we might want to drag up into this down close candle because we have a candle high and a candle low, SIBI. So it might want to reach back up into this fair value gap and act as resistance and then maybe uh, go softer, especially if we continuously see what? Dollar going higher, which is why you saw weakness and why the uh, gold market dropped like it did. It's not a surprise when you start looking at it from a macro stance. So whenever we sit down on the weekend or we go through our analysis in the morning, I always revisit my macro analysis because it's easy to see something on a lower time frame chart and think, oh, yes, is that same thing I saw when I was 22 as a trader and I, I did really well with it because it, you know, you can't do that. You got to take it back to the core macro analysis. And yes, I can trade against core macro analysis, but in the beginning, you shouldn't be trying to do that because it will help frame experience and provide you a means of measuring progress. Because you're continuously doing the same things and getting progressively better at doing it versus insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again, which is jumping from method, jumping from model, jumping from educator, jumping from market to market, different time frames, different style of trading. That's insanity. So you have to give yourself a chance really to do well. All right. So we're a couple minutes away from the open. Now, you can see this fair value gap here. Would you take that? No. Why? Because we've already moved a lot and we were, we've were we already tapped into sell side. So what could happen at the open, we could start to sell off a little bit. Get everybody thinking, okay, it's been going down. It's going to keep going down. So they'll dog pile in going short and then they'll rip it up above this volume imbalance. This here is the only exposed area I see in price with the exception of this one. Why? There's no overlap between the candle before this one with this candle and this candle between their respective highs and lows, meaning this here and here, if you take that there. So that is a SIBI. It is a fair value gap by classification, but specifically it is a sell side of balance, buy side of efficiency. So within this run from here to here, that is above equilibrium. I'm not stating that this is what's going to happen, folks. Be mindful of that. And then some of you are like, okay, he's telling us it's a buy. I'm not saying that at all. I'm answering questions you're probably seeing. This fair value gap, what would you do with it? I would do nothing with it. I would watch. Why? Why are we, why are we watching price right now? Because it's already fulfilled several things on dollar. And it's already fulfilled a run on liquidity here ahead of 930. If this would have been trading up here, Still, I'd say, okay, I'm looking for a short and I'm going to target that low. But because we already broke down, the model that I taught last year has already delivered. So since it's already delivered what I would expect reasonably, so you have to be careful. So anything here that we, we get from this fair value gap I mentioned, we could take out that low, entice new sellers at the open. And then this is electronic trading hours. If you go here to regular trading hours, Right now, the price is 41.13 and a quarter, okay? We go to regular, play, uh, regular trading hours. Chart looks different, doesn't it? So we're down here in electronic trading, and we have a gap from yesterday's close to here. 
So now think about that. We have already tapped into cell side here. Don't worry, I'll go back into that chart in a second. We've already traded down here. We hit it. Yes, we do have a fair value gap here. But just because it's a fair value gap doesn't mean it's a tradable entry point. It's something that we watch, just like this volume imbalance here. Okay, Because we're down here at 41.13 and a half in electronic trading, the markets are going to see the market as a gap lower and street money sees, oh, it's weak. Let me get short. Let me sell my stocks. And we're about 30 seconds away from the opening. So any movement lower, they're going to chase that. When we have a significant gap between where the markets view it from regular trading hours, it's more likely that they'll want to trade back up into that range versus I would not want to chase it lower here. So not every fair value gap is an entry. Not every uh, imbalance is a reason to get into the trade. All right, market's open. Now, I'd like to see it. I want to see it take out that low, to be honest with you, first. I don't want to see it run from here. I want to see it take out that low. Man, I hope my audio has been working. <laughs> Look at that reaction off the fair bank out there. That was nice. But you said I didn't say anything except for just study it. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything with it yet. Now we've taken out the low. If we can rally, okay. If we can rally, and I don't know for certain we're going to do it yet because it's only a couple minutes now into the new opening. But if we rally above it and find some support here, that's what I'm watching and observing to see if we can do that and then run up into this area here. Otherwise, we could very well just keep on melting lower. And then later in the morning, going into the afternoon, uh, try to do something out of this outline and with that gap from yesterday's trading. Okay, now if we go back to regular trading hours, this is what everybody's seen. The market was here and we got down. Oh my goodness, the market's going lower. So street money's doing what? Selling, selling, selling. Be mindful of this. If we do continuously drop, 41.0650, is, is something, in my mind, significant because it's consequent encouragement of that wick. Let me, let me see if I can make a visual aid here. So, theoretically what I'm saying is, is from the close of yesterday to the open of today, this range is likely to be traded back up into so all of this here and where does it take us up into that fair value gap which is why i mentioned it earlier so all of this now has been explained why it's important to me why i'm watching it why it's and you know even worth mentioning So on the downside, we had that consequent encroachment on that wick. I would have liked to have seen that hit that first. But if we rip from here, that's fine. And before you can get to the point where you can get in and take trades and trust what the logic is that you're trying to trade on, you have to do this part, folks. And it feels like it's a waste of time. It feels like it's monotonous. It's, you know, it's unproductive. When it's extremely productive, Sitting here watching these candles form around specific times of the day, the logic behind it, why it should do certain things, why it shouldn't do certain other things, it's crucial. And you won't be influenced by anybody, not that you should be on social media anyway, but listening to other people 
if you have no business, you know, trying to find your own model or trying to you know, develop your own approach to dealing, or you don't have the discipline to do that, you've known that enough to you would rather follow someone else that knows what they're doing, then there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're trying to learn how to do this, my opinion is, is even if someone's successful and you're following them, the only thing you're developing is codependence. And I don't like that in people. Like I think independence is a much stronger trait than, you know, depending upon someone else to, to show you their cards. But there is a market for it. There's a there's a student base out there that's better suited for that because they have no intent they have no interest in learning how to trade because they know their own limitations. So think about what has transpired here from seven o'clock. Okay, from here down into the sell side. So it delivered a beautiful low resistance liquidity run. It was in agreement with the dollar index going higher. We had support of like the euro wanting to go lower, um, gold wanting to go lower. So everything with a risk off scenario delivered price, you know, as we see here. The better, and this is for your journal, the better morning sessions are if we open up with this framework, as, as, as excuse me, as I've outlined, if it hadn't done the drop, like say for instance, it was trading like here at 930 and we hadn't taken out that low yet, that is a real obvious, easy opening session trade where that's where I would be doing it. But notice what has already happened at, one, at 930, right here on this candle, it had already delivered into the sell side. So in my mind, you know, my experience tells me just sit still. It's already done something. And because it's opening at 9.30, there's initial volatility, there's uncertainty. We don't know if it's going to run up into that red area here. I could be completely wrong. It could just go right on through that 41.0650 level and dollars scream higher. That's the uncertainty that's associated with this type of market structure at the time of the 9.30 opening after the delivery of the model that I taught you last year. Everything has already transpired. So we have to sit and wait, demand more information. That is never a bad thing. It's never a bad thing because trades always repeat themselves. There's more setups that's going to work repeating in the future that you're going to keep yourself from being able to be a participant of by rushing in in low probability uncertain times because you're here in front of the charts. So therefore, you must take a trade. That's asinine. That's that's gambling. Watch that 41.0650 level. So here you go. You have an example of me outlining a trade that I would not take, which is trading in that fair value gap, but it offered five handles. You might look at that and say, that was perfect. That's cherry for me. It meets every one of my criteria. Don't let me influence. I'm just saying, because you want to hear me tell you these things. This is what I would do. This is what I wouldn't do. This is why I wouldn't want to do it. That's mentoring. Now, if we get above this fair value gap now, after this, and touch that support, I think we could potentially run up into here. I still would have favored that 41.0650 hitting first, though. <clears throat> I've drank two bottles of water, so I have to relieve myself. I'll be back in a second. Just watch and see if we get above this gap here, if it acts as support. Watch and see if it delivers there.
All right, so now we have traded up through the fair value gap. Now look to the left. What do we have here? One, two down close candles. Midpoint of that, both ranges are potentially a bullish order block. We don't know for certain it is until we displace. So I'm watching the midpoint of that level. I don't want to see price go back down below that. I would want to see it rally from here and trade up into that level here, not piercing or going below this level here. If this was a trading day, like say I wanted to take a trade, I would not use full leverage because it's going against what? What's the undertone of the marketplace? The market is likely to see what? Higher dollar if it continues. So that's what? Invitation for risk off. So while the trade might be there, it very well could deliver and go up into 4121. I can't offer myself the potential to lose full risk, like the industry says, it's 2%. It's too high for someone that's new. 2% is too much risk. But whatever your maximum threshold for risk would be, would not be utilized on a trade like this. So let's, for instance, say you see me trade with like 20 contracts. I would do like three. Because it's engaging price. I'm not opening myself up to larger risk against against the potential for the dollar index to rally higher which would put pressure on a long entry in forex or in index futures like this so there's a lot of managing and weighing out that has to be done it's simply not just give me an order block give me a fair value gap you have to measure these things out and the, your primary role as a trader is to preserve capital and manage risk because if you don't do those two things, it doesn't matter what pattern you learned. It doesn't matter what structure or approach that you use to trade with. You're going to lose. <laughs> All right. So the next point of interest we want to see it go through would be the volume and balance here. Now, I would want to see if we can if we can do it. If it can trade through the volume and balance, I want to see it do so with speed and no respect of it. In other words, I want to see it go through it and not come back and touch it. Now, it can go up to it, start a new candle, touch it, and then expand. That's fine. I'm not looking for a type of run up, stop short of this box, and then come back down and find support and then go up to it. I don't want to see that. Why would I expect something like that? Why would I want that? Number one, because we have outlined this morning that the dollar index is been bullish. It can it can continue being bullish later in the morning here and completely pressure this from wanting to go where? Preventing it to go higher. So you're trading right now in a what? High resistance liquidity run. It doesn't matter if it goes up here. That I don't want you thinking I was right or we were right watching it. That's not what I'm I'm not trying to build that as the argument. What I'm saying is, is look how hard it is for price to want to get there under these present conditions. I'm teaching you high probability trading, but I have to teach you what high resistance liquidity runs look like. So that way you can avoid trading them, or at least once you get into trading, you've identified it's what it is. You can pair the risk back and not demand that it goes to your targets because many times in these types of conditions, I might see a potential setup. I might see a target. I'm, I've made mine available here. This is what I think is likely to occur. I'm more prone to be wrong, if you want to think about it in terms of being right or wrong. I'm more prone to be wrong and not have my trade pan out when it's under these types of conditions, which is why I teach my students to, to specifically target times when the market's likely to go one direction. It's so heavy handed. It's very hard to defend, you know, no, not defend, to present both sides of the, the equation. So if you can look at a trade setup and you can argue it from both sides of the, the coin, like I could see a sell here, I could see a buy here. In my definition, that is a low probability trade. 
versus it is so overwhelmingly likely to go this direction because it has all these other factors behind it. That to me is high probability. And I understand the limitations of the, the terminology and definition I just gave there for someone new that doesn't do justice. But for someone that has been doing this for a little bit of time and maybe not even profitable yet, it made much more sense to that person and maybe even more for those that are profitable. You know, you know what your setups look like. And that's what I'm saying. But as a new student to the marketplace, you really don't know what your setup is because you don't even know what you're doing. You're just floundering around watching these candles and trying to chase the next person that's hot. So in this instance, say I was unaware, not that that would happen, but say I was unaware that the dollar index has been trading the way it has been. Okay. Um, say I got myself into a trade and I discovered that I'm in a high resistance liquidity run. At this moment, I would start doing that typical, I want to see in the next two or three minutes, I want to see some favorable price action. So that means I would want to see it start to you know, trade higher, take out the short term high here. And at least touch the volume imbalance. So since we have the markers here on the five minute chart, I'm going to start dropping down in our time frames. And you can see there's really nothing in here. It's just a lot of chop. And I'm only telling you what is likely to occur because we've already went down. We took out the low. We have a volume imbalance and we have a, a fair value gap here within, within the gap that's established from yesterday's trading to today's opening. Okay, it's four minutes, three minutes. Look what's here now. Relative equal highs. They're, they're very clean. I like the idea if it can run one more time below that low. Hit that 41.0650, maybe even pierce 41.0650. And then if it rejects that, these levels here I have, I think are much more significant right now. It's still a lot of uncertainty there. And again, these are the conditions you get once you see the delivery of a objective on a setup. Again, getting back to that sell side here. Because it's done so before the 930 opening, this right here, this is exactly what makes the morning chop at the opening. This is what creates that condition, all these factors together. Because it's already delivered what would be reasonable in terms of a very high probability, low resistance liquidity run signature. It just means in plain terms, easy language, it would be the easy setup going short has already happened from over here and it went to target. So since it's already done so before the markets open at 930, that means the market's going to chop around until it can establish more sentiment. Right now, in my opinion, they're trying to force the narrative that it's going to go lower. And they like to do that with presenting relative equal highs like this. So that looks like what? Oh, it stopped here. It stopped here and starts to drop down. So that means what? This is resistance, right? That's what a retail trader sees. That's what street money sees. What's resting above those highs right now? Buy side. Buy stops. So ripping above that and the volume imbalance, how far can it go above that into this gap here? which now is refined with this candle here. So from this candle here and here, so we can refine it to this. It's a little bit more sensitive because initially I had it set on the five minute chart. Now we're in a three minute chart. So it's a little bit more refined now. And so hopefully, you know, the point is you're learning this morning how to anticipate the chop the anticipation of when the market's going to rip higher and build bias, even in the, under the present 
of a high resistance liquidity run, we have our volume of balance traded to here. So remember I said, I wanna see in the next two to three minutes, it needs to get into that volume of balance. So it's met that threshold. This down close candle here, the way I observe that is I don't wanna see it go down and close below the midpoint of that. It can come down and touch it, that's fine, because it's also that old fair value guy. But I wanna see if it does that, it needs to rip higher and aggressively run. Now think about, think about, and now some of you in here have tried to press the button, I'm sure, and you're flipping out right now because you're seeing all this chop and you're wondering, is this the day ICT's got it wrong? Is this the day he's gonna be right? Oh my goodness, you're worrying about the outcome of your trade that you should have never entered versus having the peace of mind knowing how to read this and not have any emotional commitment to it whatsoever. The folks that are not pushing the button are actually learning today. You're learning fear and greed and buyer's remorse. But imagine if you were in a trade right now, is it showing you a, a state of delivery that is very comforting? It shouldn't. It's choppy. These are market conditions. When you're in them, they feel like you're being strangled and darkness is about to slip on and envelop you. You can't. It's like it's choking you. And you don't want to be in trades like that. You want to find trades that are very easy. Just, just once you get in them, not long after entering them, it starts moving in your favor and it starts delivering quickly and you have big ranges in your favor. That's a low resistance liquidity run signature. That's what I'm teaching you to find. But you have to see what they are not to know when they exist. This is a high resistance liquidity run. It still can deliver. It absolutely can do it. But... It can do so with gray hair or a loss of hair. <laughs> it's very stressful sometimes, and it can it feels like it's an eternity, and or it completely fail on you. And that's that's always a probability with any trade, really. But it's more likely to fail when you're trading in these kind of conditions. And I hope I'm I hope I'm communicating that effectively today. So we've taken those smooth relative equal highs out. We traded up into the volume imbalance and we're back down in here. So in my mind, watch this fair value gap now because it might want to act as resistance and tag that 41.0650 level. Tug of war day. <clears throat> These are days I'm so glad I'm not in it. <laughs> when I was a younger man, I would insist, there's something to do right here. I just don't know what it is. Let me take a guess. Eh. Oh, forget that. <laughs> All right, so now watch the uh, 4121 level. Looks like it's respecting a breaker. I mean, it's not the best breaker. But let me show you. We have low, lower low. So I'm watching how price reacts in there. I don't care about the wick. I'm looking at the body. It's really, really hard to, to read it when it's like this choppiness. And it's just a really like a, a an experience thing. And, it, and if I'm right, don't read into it as, as skill. It's not skill because it's not something I'm pushing a button on. 
but you should be feeling the trouble, the struggle, the difficulty in reading this, which is exactly when you identify it like this, here's what you do. Okay. You close your trade right as soon as you, as soon as you discover that you're in these types of environments, close your trade. But I'm I, ICT, I'm under, close your trade, close it because you're going to end up spending more mental capital than you're going to make in real life profit. Even if it goes to your target, you're going to spend more time worrying about this trade when there's so many other very good setups that aren't going to force you into something like this. When does the market chop at the open? When it's already delivered its move pre-market. And that's what you're seeing here. And then it becomes a 50-50. It could go up to that red box. And I'm hoping I, I'm hoping that it doesn't because I want you to see me get it wrong in these contexts, in this context, in this condition, because then it'll prove to you why I'm teaching you the way I'm teaching you. If it goes up there, you're just going to think, well, he just got it right again. I don't want that actually to occur here. I want to be wrong. I want to be wrong and say, see, this is why that condition is exactly what you should be fearful of as a trader. This is the thing you should be fearful of, falling victim to this, insisting on it's going to go where you want it to go versus, okay, this is more work than it needs to be. Let me just close it and I'll come back at another time where it's cleaner. What does that mean cleaner? When price runs very efficiently, it doesn't waste a lot of time. Retracements go to specific levels that are predetermined. We can see them as visibility to it. And it's easy draw. Where right now is it more likely to go to? Is it easier for it to get to 4121 or to get to 410650? It's 5050. Either one of those scenarios I could make a case for right now. And whichever one forms the people that side with that, they will think that that was skill and it's not. And that's what I fell victim to in the beginning when I was a 20 year old. I was getting lucky and attributed it falsely to skill. Whereas now I'd like to believe I'm a little bit more versed. I've picked up a whole lot of wisdom through pain. <laughs> so uh, it's a big difference between me now and as a 20 year old. But when you first start, you don't have that measuring stick, right? You just have your emotions. And as young men, we like to think, you know, we're that caveman. We get it right. You know, you're, you're, Thor, the, un, you know, the unconquerable. This wick right here, half of that, since it was traded here, and we're looking at the bodies, it's not showing a willingness to get back above that original five minute fair value gap, which is that green box. So let's take a look at this on a one minute chart. How's that make you feel? <laughs> yep. 50 50. 410650 or 4121. Who's going to be right? And the beauty is, is neither one is a factor for you as a trader right now. You're completely at the peace of mind knowing that you're not influenced by, oh, but if it moves there, I could catch that move. There's going to be so many other moves that are cleaner, easier, easier to deliver, to transport your entry to target much more efficiently and faster, really. Whereas this, you know, it could go either way. This candle we're on right now just went right up to that fair bay gap and touched it as resistance, as you would expect. Low, low, and low. So there's sell side right below here, 
If they're going to go below that, they're going to run it to here and in that consequent encroachment wick at 41.0650. And if some of you are new are thinking to yourself, man, there's no way I would know how to do this. You will. It's the same stuff repeating all the time. Everything worth doing takes a little bit more effort than the average person is willing to do. And you should commend yourself for wanting to do this because this is one of the hardest things in the world to do. So now, let's, this is another thing I like to do, and this is how I've always taught my students as well. Say you're late to get into the charts. Okay, first, first sitting down, you turn your charts on, you overslept, you run to your charts, and this is what you see. What do you feel confident about? Admittedly, I'm thinking 4106.50 if I'm looking at the chart right now. But I'm not looking at the chart thinking, i got to get in that. I'm going to miss something. Look at this. Does anything in here look like anything I've taught on my YouTube channel for opportunity? No. So what are you doing? You're gambling if you enter into this. There's nothing. It's a 50-50 condition. And if you don't understand that, if you can't see that, you're going to fall victim to this type of day. I guarantee you there's YouTubers out there right now trying to insist that it's going to do one thing or another right now. And I'm not trying to be argumentative or rude to any of them. But because you're in front of other people in a live stream, you're sharing your opinion, guess what? You're going to force something. And that's why as a, a new student or a new trader, the worst thing you can do is put yourself out there in front of other people because it's going to make you impulsive versus using sound logic good risk management and are you really following your model or are you just doing something because you want to perform see that volume imbalance right here Now, I'm going to ask you to study this. This is a very, very poor condition to do it in. But see if that volume imbalance acts as resistance as a run to 410650. Nothing there. <clears throat> For those of you who have been very disciplined this morning, I'm proud of you. And you should be thinking to yourself, I'm glad I didn't do anything today. <laughs> So the sellers that were interested in chasing markets lower today at the open haven't seen much in delivery on the downside. Since we went down below that old low at 41.13, which is the level I told you to focus on for sell side, we've had one, two, three, four times where we ran out short-term buy side. And we dropped down and only taken out one, with this low, two with that low. So it to me looks like we probably rounded out the morning, morning low, and we'll likely see that 4121 now. Okay. 
down close candle, mid, mean threshold, which is half of it, which is real close to the middle of that wick right there. Devil's advocate to say I was long, say I was foolishly trying to push something. I'd want to see it now in the next two candles. And we're in a one minute chart. The next two or three candles, I want to see it run higher and reach back up into that old buy side liquidity pool here. And if, say I was in a trade, say I was in a trade and I realized I was potentially in a high resistance liquidity run signature and I'm having difficulty getting to target. By having this two to three minute filter, if it doesn't deliver as I'm expecting, which is this blue line right here, it needs to get above that. Then I would close the trade and be done regardless of wherever I was. That's the benefit of having that time filter. Why would I want to do that? Because I'm going to hold on to something that could potentially turn worse on me or just stay exactly where it's at doing nothing. So it's important to understand these conditions because you will eventually fall victim to it. So there's a lot of times where the market looks like it's going to offer beautiful price delivery. You know, the setups are just easy, like it's dangling you know, candy in front of you. And then once you take it and you pay for it by entering and paying the commissions and incurring the risk, you regret it. And then you don't want to close it out because you fearfully think that as soon as I close the trade out, then it's going to run in my favor and then I'll feel stupid. Well, more times than not, you're going to regret having held on to the trade. So what are we seeing so far? Every reason to expect choppiness, uncertainty came to fruition. Take a look at NASDAQ. I haven't looked at that this morning. I apologize. I should have brought it up sooner. Hmm. Look at the hourly chart over here. See this range we're in? Sloppy. Take a look at Dow. <laughs> no, thank you. All right, so that would be the end of, I would not hold the position. If I had a position on, I would close it and be content with, okay, it's not doing what I wanted to see it do. Time filter parameter kicked in. It didn't deliver where I wanted to see it deliver at least the minimum. So I would cut bait. So whenever you hear me for, refer to cut bait, either I'm in a position, I'm closing it, or I'm no longer interested in pursuing anything for that session. And I would just move to sidelines and be flat and do nothing and not worry about, even if it does whatever it's going to do, I'm not going to go back and look at the chart and say, oh, I wish I would have. Because experience will teach you if you exist in long, you know, the longevity is offered to you by doing the right things and avoiding the wrong things. If you stay in this business long enough, you're going to see that there are more times that you're going to wish you would have gotten out versus holding on to it. When it's problematic and you know, suggesting otherwise crummy conditions, it's better simply to move to the sidelines. Because if anybody's looking at this and saying, oh, yeah, that's one of those XYZ patterns that always works out, uh, you're, you're talking out the other end. <laughs> okay, that's nonsense. So here we have one more piercing of the daily low. And again, I really would have liked to have seen that 41.0650 level get tagged. We have a breaker now. Old fair value got, right? 
can take us right into that right there. What's the low on the NASDAQ? Yeah, it made a lower low too. I was looking at the lows from here, seeing if it had failed to make a plotted the NASDAQ comparatively and I'm looking at the lows plotted on NASDAQ and I'm comparing respectively the ES lows versus that of the, the NASDAQ. And 4106 should be hit. For some of you that just got here, the uh, 4106 level is this over here on a five minute chart. That wick right here, and I think we just hit it, didn't we? Yeah, 4106.50. Hit it as consequent encroachment on that wick. And we'll see, does it want to offer any return back up in the, the gap that has formed? Again, this is, let me make another notation. Opening to Friday's close. That blue shaded area, that's the range. We had it trade up into that inside this range is gap. Tried several times to do it. Let's move lower. We've hit consequent encroachment at 410650. And I believe that the better price action will be in the afternoon session. The opportunity still lies with if the market can find a low set up something as a run in the afternoon up here. I favor that. Based on all I'm seeing right now, that's what I favor. Anything can happen between now and over the lunch hour. But I would like to see that as a potential framework for like the two, uh, the 1.30 to 4 o'clock session. So we got up essentially about halfway through that gap. This is that blue shade area represented by yesterday's day session close and 9.30 opening today. It's very hard for me to have this on my chart and I hopefully and not making it harder for you, but this is a lot of lipstick on a chart for me. But I just want you to see the representation of that gap from yesterday's trading to this morning's opening. That range is important. And we see it trade up about half of it here. And I'm going to take this other stuff off because it's no longer seen. So just be mindful of that, that range here. Have those levels on your chart. Yeah, that's going to be it for me this morning. So, not a terribly exciting one, obviously, but you got to see some some elements of uh, price action that we we like to see deliver, and then also learning when I sit still, why I sit still, what 
constitutes a reason for me not to want to do it. And unfortunately, in your, when you're new, you can't appreciate that type of lesson because it feels like you should be pushing a button. You should be showing me the market's going to move, a big move. And if the market's not going to move, it doesn't matter how many things I talk about, liking about it, it won't make price go up or down. It's not, it's not going to do like that. It doesn't work like that. So the market has to be in a position to be predisposed to go higher or lower with a great deal of ease. That's very low resistance liquidity runs. And we're not seeing that here. And you can't walk away from this thinking foolishly that it was an unprofitable study because these are the very things that you're going to chop yourself up, do lots of needless, silly trades, chasing the next breakout, thinking this is going to be the real run. This is going to be the real move. This is going to be the thing that I've been waiting for all morning. I'm going to get all my losses back. And the only thing that ends up happening is you compound your losses into larger ones and or blow your account. I'm telling you, this is exactly what it looks like. This is why it forms this way. And all the things that were outlined here, if the move delivers before 9.30, expect 9.30 to be choppy and trade the afternoon session. Done. Simple. That's why also sometimes you see me entering and doing trades before 9.30. Why? But you said the idea should be we should be trading. Yeah, you should be focusing on 9.30. And if there's news at 8.30, focus there too. But if the moves form a setup before that, there's nothing saying you can't trade 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning. If the framework is offering it to you, there, there's your setup. But by doing that, know that when 9.30 comes and the U.S. equities market opens, it's usually the opening bell, ding, ding, ding. You know, CNBC whole business makes a big deal about it. When that occurs, this is what you're likely to see, this type of messiness. And you don't want to look at this and trick yourself into thinking this is opportunity. It is opportunity. It's opportunity for you to hurt yourself, do reckless trading, churn your account for a broker's sake, and you lose it or create drawdown. This is exactly where it creeps into your trading. And in the beginning, when you listen to these 20-year-olds that think that they have things figured out, you'll fall victim to that. Just like I fell victim to things on America Online. Back in 1992 and 93, there was always these hucksters out there, always trying to tell you something, do this, buy this. And it was in these instances that they were quiet. They didn't have an answer for it. And people were getting wrecked. You have to know where these types of conditions will manifest. Where will they likely form? And by knowing that, number one, it prevents you, hopefully, from losing control of yourself and over-expecting price delivery on a day like this in these types of conditions. It's easy to see it after the fact and say, oh, I wish I would have known that. It's altogether something different, and it's only guided by experience. And no book, no educator, no five-minute trainer. Nobody's going to teach that lesson to you. You have to live it. You have to be hurt by it a few times and say, okay, I understand what this is now. It's pretty interesting how that 410650 level reacted, isn't it? I'm giving it time to see if it can get to that breaker. That's this candle here. If it can get above that, find some support. I'm going to watch that run there. I see these addicted. <laughs> Yeah, for the last 30 years, I've been addicted. It's the best drug on the, on the planet. Price. If you look at the lows right at the 410650 level, as it hit that, see what the NASDAQ wasn't able to do? It didn't make that lower low. That was the whole point of me bringing it up, showing it to you. I got busy jawboning. So here's where, this is where we usually see, okay, gun to my head, okay? If I had to do something right now, I wouldn't want to do anything right now, admittedly. But if I had to do something right now, 
Would I be more interested in being short or more interested in being long? I would be more interested in being long. I'd like to see it trade down to that fair value gap right there, reprice to here, and then into this area here. <clears throat> I bought these head I bought this headset here and I thought I was doing myself good but uh, I'm not sure why it just died there's no way the battery died that quick so I'm probably doing something wrong with it the idea would be invalid at that point Apologize, should I end that at the beginning? Why am I picking that level? Because it's below the middle point of this down close candle. That's mean threshold. So my stop would be below that. I don't have a trade on, so please don't take that as an invitation to push the button. Okay? I know some of you in here just are doing that and I don't want you doing it. Remember, high resistance. High resistance creates a lot of pausing, deeper retracements than you than you would rather see and ultimately failure. In a low resistance liquidity run signature, this thing would have already been over 41.19 because of time of the morning, because we've already priced in a lower low, and we have a divergence between the NASDAQ, so the averages are not confirming one another. See that reaction? That's what high resistance liquidity runs do. It's very, very give and take back a lot. Give and take a lot. It's, it's, it's very frustrating to be in these types of trades. Even when they pan out, it's very difficult that you understand the distinctions between the two. See how it's still sloppily, still trading sideways? It's very, very hard to get excited about a move like this today. So if you're new and you haven't traded with real money yet, you've been spared the pain and anguish that these types of environments create for you. It, most people end up losing their accounts and chopping themselves up with because they they try to fix the problem of doing something they knew they should have never done. Take a trade in an environment that is iffy, like a 50-50 condition. And everyone's done this. If you've ever traded with money, you know exactly the few times that stand out in your mind that you wish you never would have done those trades on that day, that day because you knew it was most likely not going to pan out for you, but you couldn't leave it alone. The feeling is you want to get back in there and fix it right away. You want to erase it. Let me just go back and fix it, and then I'll stop trading for the day, and I'll be glad I, I fixed it, and I'm, I'm smarter for doing so. 
that never works out like that. It ends up becoming a bigger drawdown. Now, if it doesn't run higher on this candle, it isn't going to run higher. On. Stopping on a day like this before pain is much more a factor is wisdom. It won't feel like wisdom. It'll feel like you're cheating yourself out of potential to make more or fixing a problem. Don't ever think that. Don't ever think that. If the market's ugly and you recognize it as being ugly and you start feeling heavy chested and you're breathing heavy heart palpitations that would be a stop out now do I need to get in here and trade this and lose in front of you for you to appreciate the fact that this is exactly what you want to avoid I don't need to push a button to do that everything I'm outlining here is problematic for you going forward if you don't listen to it contrast it with other days where it's easy you know every single time I talk about it on Twitter when I talk about it on Twitter, those examples, they've been pretty much 98%. They're under the pretense of a low resistance liquidity run. You don't see me pointing out, oh, well, this is going to be a hard run here. It's going to be a sticking point at this price level. It's sloppy. It's choppy. You don't want to trade in these conditions. And the problem is, is you'll see these things sometimes allow you to fix a problem, fix an error, fix a losing streak that you had that morning. And you'll think that that's skill. You see that lower low on the S&P? It hasn't been met with the NASDAQ. See that right here? Now by itself means absolutely nothing. The fact that it's done so on a day where we've opened with a large gap lower we've taken out the low here here and here how many buy side now have we taken out this high from here this high here this high here so anybody that's wanting to sell on a breakout they're short anyone that's already short feels confident and we have a large gap still unfulfilled above us with an S&T divergence between the averages. So the averages did not confirm that lower low in NASDAQ. So assuming that we don't go crashing lower between now and 130, I would like, and this is not an invitation for you to trade, but I would like to see if it makes it an opportunity for the market to want to run up into that 41.21, 41.23 level during the PM session. And by having that as a potential narrative to work with in the afternoon, it allows you to just let the market do whatever it's going to do. But what happens if you come back at 1.30 and it has already done that? Then it's over. You missed it. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means you missed that trade. But what happens if it does offer that potential and fails. You're going to fail in trading. You're going to have trades that don't pan out. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, everybody has losing trades. Everyone's going to have their setups that they think is really there. They're not going to be fruitful. All right, let's watch one more.
We've got volume amounts, SMT divergence here, breaker, buy side. When I was younger, these are the lessons I would have paid money for. Because this is how I hurt myself. Every time I blew an account, I was forcing trades in days like this. And insisting on, I was, I was right. I was going to be right finally. I was finally going to be right. Now, any other day, I would treat this as a long entry. Why? Short-term high taken here. We retraced, we took sell side out, and we have a divergence SMT, and we've not been able to accelerate on the downside on a day we gapped lower. So I would want to see it really start to run higher and attack that buy side here. But again, watch how it delivers under the context of a high resistance liquidity run. Everything I've outlined this morning, this is what you have in ahead of you. You don't have the wind at your back. It's in your face. And it's like hurricane force. It's forcing back against you in your trades. And it's very, very frustrating. If you don't know what you're experiencing and you can't observe it, it can be very, very frustrating. And it makes you get emotional. It makes you feel like you feel reckless. you know, And that type of thing causes you to do what? Remove a stop loss, in this case would be right here. Mean threshold there, this stop would be there. So, I mean, there's a lot of things about this industry that don't get talked much about in books and such, but traders, that's why I love listening to people that actually trade. Because what they say and how they experience an internalized price action and listening and observing the frustrations or the elation that they feel while they're in a, in a market move, to me is much, much more fascinating. Because these candlesticks are really about psychology more than they're anything else. They're... Rorschachs, they're, they, they're like ink blots. You're going to make them say whatever you want them to say because you want to do something. You want to trade. You want to force a narrative. You want to force an idea. You want to do something that causes potential for you to make money because that making of the money means that you're significant. And that significance is a powerful drug. That's why social media is so addictive. One more touch there. Now, on another day where we're not being met with high resistance, that would have been another entry for me, you know, adding more to it. But you can't think that today with this because we have all of these other factors fighting against you. And these are the things I was doing when I had uh, my first year mentorship. And I was sitting in the room with a GoToWebinar. I had 800 and some people, 868 people, 864, something like that. And in the chat window, I had the mistake, made the mistake of being able to see that, which was terrible for me because it was very distracting. And I had, I was trying to teach this over the charts live. And I would get a thousand questions. What about this? And what about that? And I'm trying to do my best <laughs> to try to you know, service everyone's request and, and question. And it was such a state of confusion. Like I couldn't focus. I could not focus. And I was frustrated with myself. I was frustrated with my students because they weren't willing to listen. They weren't willing to listen and see what it was I was showing them and understanding there's a lesson in understanding that a high resistance liquidity run, you will see things in the price action. It doesn't mean that it's going to deliver like you want them to. 
and they still might deliver like you would like to see them deliver. But you can't actively seek trading in those conditions and keep peace of mind while you're trading because it's, it's, it makes it harder than it has to be. I really want to see it hit that red line and be a technical a hypothetical stop out because that would be communicating what I'm teaching you today, what to avoid. Don't try to force trades in these conditions. If it runs up there and hits the buy side and hits that rectangle up there, you're going to foolishly assume that that's skill and you're going to be able to do this type of thing going forward. That's not what this lesson is about. That's not what the focus is. It's to show you by contrast, when you see me trading in low resistance liquidity runs, it's easy. It's real easy. That's why it looks easy because everything is going in your favor. Everything is. You got time of day. You have all the other factors supporting it. You risk on, risk off. All the price delivery. You know, everything is just like precision. That's the, that's the example I share on Twitter. That's why they work. I don't force those types of things in Twitter when it's like this. That's what makes it different. And when you see other people tweeting to me and saying, oh, you know, how is he able to do this? How does he know which one? Number one, it's experience. Two, I'm avoiding these kind of conditions because even a very good trader, a very good trader trading in these types of conditions will look like a novice because the markets are just being very fickle. They're not going to, they're not going to present you the opportunity that you would rather see and it's unfortunate because as a new trader you don't have the patience to appreciate good wisdom and sound logic when it's presented to you because you're you're weighing everything on the basis of right or wrong making money or not making money show me with a live account or it doesn't matter the logic works or it doesn't work no buttons are being pushed here and i'm proving that even in these conditions I'm not as precise, which is exactly what we're trying to focus on here, showing how you are going to avoid that same condition going forward. Because if you don't understand where the potholes are, you're going to fly over top of them and just slam right in there. And it's going to do what? It's going to mess your alignment up. It's going to tear up your alignment, just like in your car. If you hit a big old pothole, boom, what happens? Your alignment's off. You might still drive. It might not pull that much to the right or to the left. But given enough time, what happens? It wears your tires away prematurely. More costs. That means you're going to be doing things differently. You're going to steer to the right or the left when your trading should have been straight ahead. You've been affected now. Your bearings have been deviated from. And you're going to incur more loss because those wear and tear on the tires, that's the wear and tear on your equity. You're going to be constantly taking on more trades more losing, more drawdown than is necessary if you would have learned a lesson like this one. Understanding where there's going to be problem areas in the marketplace and trying not to force the issue. Don't try to head, you know, don't go 55 mile an hour into a pothole when you know that that's going to be likely the scenario going forward in the marketplace for that given session or that day. Why are you flooring it? You're flooring it and you're trying to correct every issue, oversteering. And then that causes you to crash too. So all these factors, all these things, as a new trader or as a new student, you have no idea how to you know, appreciate those types of lessons because you think it's push a button, get me in, make me money. Like it's a video game. It's so much more than that. Way more than that. And books and courses, you know, they don't do it. Like you got to sit with somebody and let them walk you through it step by step, candle by candle, over time. And you'll see, oh yeah, I get it now. Nobody, nobody in, in Twitterville, okay, or YouTube would have been able to outline all this mess beforehand and navigate it efficiently. 
And if they've done so, and if they were profitable, if they are online and they're saying they did it with skill, that's nonsense. Because anybody with any measure of experience would know that you're just getting lucky in this sloppy chop mess. And that was a very painful thing for me because I was attributing it as skill when I was getting lucky in the early days and it was not luck. It was just, no, it was luck rather. It wasn't skill. It was blind luck. And it was a very bitter pill. You know, see, I would want to see that guy. I went down the consequent encroachment, this gap right here. It needs to really tear off and take out these highs. These are relatively equal. And if it does so go above that, it needs to rip through it, not go above it and come back down in. So look at this right here. And this will hopefully be the last one we talk about. Come on here. So this fairway gap here with the order block, uh, dropped down into it. We rallied. I'd want to see it really tear off, not come back down into this again. It need not do that. It needs to go above these relative equal highs and not return back into that. It needs to accelerate through. What would that mean for a trade? Okay. Um, right now, we would have hypothetically five handles. And the stop would have to be below here for any partials. If, if you've taken something off, your stop would be right there below the fair value gap. And it's below the order block. And if it went down and hits you out, or if it touches this line, you'd have to be content with the five handles that you would have taken as a partial. But look how hard even five handles is in this condition. We're bumping up against that old low. Let me go back up to a five minute chart just for a second. That's it. That's what we're hitting right here. We're just hanging around below that. But look what we've done. We went low, lower lower that was not confirmed with the nasdaq that's not an indicator okay it's it's the price action of the nasdaq the what's occurring when that happens is my my belief in it is this because the nasdaq was unwilling to make a lower low when the net when the s p made a lower low here the fact that it was unable to do so in the nasdaq it's like a crack in correlation because in a perfect world, S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ should be going the same direction. And as long as they're making higher highs equally, respectively, in other words, if higher highs are being met in ES, they should be met in the NASDAQ and they should be met in the Dow. If at any time they don't do those things, then there's something going on behind the scenes that is probably noteworthy. Let me go down to one minute chart. And typically, it means that there's some kind of an intermediate term shift in the marketplace, traditionally. But when you have these types of conditions like this, it makes it harder for that to be delivered. And that would be a stop out. So you'd have to be content with whatever partial at five handles. There it's done. So, yeah, I, I wish I could do more with what we have here. But the market's going to give us what the market's going to give us, right? I'm actually interested to see if it rips now because of me sharing that level right there. Because a lot of you are probably taking this as a live trade. <laughs> oh, I got stopped out and they ran it up to 41.21. Now, here's a, here's a scenario for you. Say that I was in a trade. I took a partial off here at 5 into this breaker. Fine. Wonderful. And I rolled the stop up here. Great. It hits it and stops it out. Would there be a way for me to back go back in if it were not a day like today? How would I do that? How would I re-engage the marketplace? Well, we have this mitigation block right here. That's a closed candle, which is a breaker. Low, high, lower low. Last up close candle in that high, extend that forward. If we were to trade above it, come back down and touch it as support, I would use that as a entry technique and use the consequent encroachment of this fair value gap as a stop. And I would look for first partial here and then aim for consequent encroachment of this gap. 
that's what I would do. So I'm using each one of these PD arrays, it's kind of like a stair step or like a mountain climber. They look, where's their next grab point? Where's their next part for or point on the, the surface of the mountain or cliff? Where are they going to put their foot at? When they get there, where's the next thing they're going to do? I'm looking at price like that, whereas I'm not relying on like trend lines or uh, something else. I don't know what else you would refer to. This is actually one of the best things that could have happened today because it will filter out who's lazy. <laughs> and I've had so many people come and they're like, oh, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to do this. And then they realize how much work is involved. And like, oh, yeah, it's easier for me to go here and get this indicator. Go ahead. I'll see you in a couple of years. Now look at the range that's been formed. Between uh, nine, what is it? Nine fifty. Is that nine fifty? Nine fifty one. So nine fifty one to ten twenty eight. Just consolidating sideways. Everybody wants a breakout. That's what everybody's waiting for. They want to see this spring finally get released in one direction or the other. It's going to go higher or lower. At this point, I think it is going to go higher. We still have a lot of uh, divergence on that NASDAQ versus that low in the S&P. So take a step back for a moment and think about what we've talked about this morning. And I'll try to wind this thing down. We looked at the idea that the sell side below that uh, 41.13 level would be attacked. It, it was. It hasn't been a lot of movement below that. We keep reaching lower, but each low has been shallow. Making lower lows, yes, but they're shallow. And at the same time, when we hit that 41.650 level, which was outlined from the regular session hours, go back and listen to the video. I'll sh I show you exactly where it's at. This lower low here is not being met with the NASDAQ while we hit 41.0650 after taking sell side liquidity and nothing really happening after the session opened at 9.30. So all those factors, you know, converging on one another. And we mentioned the um, volume imbalance here. It offered it. And then from here up to the breaker. That's five handles. Five handles in slop. Eventually getting stopped out. If you used the logic I would have used, if I was in a trade, I would have been stopped out on the balance. If anything was left over, I would have been removed from that position here. But still better than the entry down here at the volume imbalance. The takeaway is right now, given everything I've outlined this morning and why it should be like this or why we would expect it to be like this. You don't want to force it or try to trade in these conditions because it's harder. It's much, much more harder than it needs to be. There's there's other conditions and market setups that are going to be a lot better for you as a trader to focus on than that of doing it simply because you have time. You took the day off because ICT's live streaming. All right, so now we have a nice run above the breaker. Watch. Now, you think I got to wait for it to trade away and come back down. You can trade right in that breaker. I shouldn't say it that way because you're going to take it as an entry. Watch and see if the price, if it can come back down and just touch the top of this. In the same candle, it can do that. It does not need to leave and then come back to it. It can. That's fine. That's how I teach it. Good grief. There you go. So again, be mindful of the low here. I'm going to take this away so we can look more at the chart. 
So the divergence between the NASDAQ failing to make that lower low. So this is like a turtle soup. How do you trade turtle soup? It takes the low out. It's at a level I already predefined, which was the 410650 level we, we mapped out earlier this morning. And then we wait for something to indicate that it's going to go higher. So what is that? We have a failure in NASDAQ making a lower low. It didn't do so when the, when the S&P did go lower. Then we rally. So we did rally. Do I need a shift in market structure on that? No. The turtle soups don't require that. That's totally different. You're trading external range liquidity when you're trading turtle soup. What is that? The low here has sell side. It takes that sell side here. Then it breaks away. All I need is one PD array. It could be a fair value gap. It could be the last down close candle if there's a fair value gap afterwards forming. Or in this case, as I outlined, see that volume imbalance? There it is. It trades down into it and then it rallies. I told you that the stop would be below that volume imbalance with the logic that I've been teaching consistently throughout all the concepts. If you're bullish, you got to find a PD array that's a discount and you have to have it show you a defined level where below midpoint of a fair value gap or a order block after a sell side liquidity pool has been rallied, you, you went below it, then you can trust where your stock can be placed. I'd like to see it run from here. It doesn't necessarily need to trade back down here. I would like to do not do it though. But if it hit it, I would expect it to react and go to the buy side there. <clears throat> I tell you, man, I drank two bottles of water and it feels like I got a gallon that's working through me. <laughs> Another thing um, new traders feel that is, is a source of trouble is if they get into a trade and they get stopped out and they have to get back in to, to get the the final portion of the move they were hoping for they think that that is a lack of skill no it's not a lack of skill if you're aware that you can still engage the marketplace and enter again how's that a lack of skill it's not a lack of skill you're still seeing opportunity you're engaging all right so now watch this one we hit the breaker here. We round above it, trade back down in. We completely repriced through the breaker. See this down close candle over here? We have the fair value gap, order block, half of that mean threshold. So we'll use, well, it's got to be below the old low because that's what this level is here. So if you were trying to use this as an entry, your stop would have to be below the old low. So you'd use like the rejection block here, which is this price. That closing price right there. I'm trying to see it here. 41.12.50. And again, observe how difficult or how fast it fails on it. <clears throat> and you'll see when we have a much more cleaner day how it's much more in, engaging but these are the lessons and that right there i think it would have been is it 1250 yep hit that right there it's much cleaner price action it's faster you'll see the runs easier and you'll see everybody having a, a different carnival like atmosphere Volume and balance. Now looking at this, we rallied up, we failed to take out that high. We're back below that old low. Remember the old low that I was telling you about for where the sell side was? That's this over here.
So we're returning back into that old low. Might want to sweep a little bit. But there's nothing down here with the exception of this old fair value gap. That's the only inefficiency that has been repriced to. Does it need to come back down into that? It could touch that again. But if it traded down below this, then it's then we're going lower on the day. Not just to take out the low, but we're going lower on the day. And why do I say that? Because we've spent lots of time trying to go lower below that old low, which is this level here. We tried multiple times going back above it. And then we tried once more here. And we failed. So the last line in the, the, the sand, if you will, for any potential run up into that old gap from yesterday's trading, it would have to mount that rally into this fair value gap higher. Otherwise, below that, we go lower below this. And that would look like... Uh, See here. I'm trying to get a daily chart with uh, nothing on it. See this candle's high. Look right here. This candle's high at 4091.25. If we take out the low again, we could expand down into that area there. And we're, we're below the fair value gap now, so. <clears throat> This is very, very difficult for me to have all this stuff on the chart and talk to you about it, but I guess there's no other way for me to communicate for you to track what it is I'm seeing. So with the exception of that divergence in NASDAQ not making that lower low, we're still just consolidating. How far, if it takes out that low, can it go? Well, I've showed you on the daily chart here to here so 4095.25 and then 409125 watch that fair value gap that we had here uh, it can bump up, up up underneath that treat that as resistance and I'm aware that this probably looks like I'm enticing you to do a lot of trades none of these are trades these are all observations for you to study and see which one would you trust more as a trader, which one makes more sense to you pattern-wise, if you want to call it that. I didn't mark that level. It's one standard deviation is what I'm measuring. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking this high down to that low, and it's like a fulcrum point. Watch and see if there's any sensitivity once it hits that fair value gap. It can trade into the fair value gap into consequent encroachment with this wick too. So just be mindful that I'm looking at that. So it can hit that and then trade below this for sell side. Um, but anyway, I was saying was this high, the fib is essentially anchored to there's a right there. So this point and this point here is what I'm putting the fib on, and this is acting as a fulcrum point. So if it were to go lower, if it was to go below this low, how far can it go? The same distance from this low to that high you know, projected from that low down. That would be one standard deviation. So one standard deviation is that, and then that daily old high, which would reprice that entire uh, buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency, which I know is a a lot of things being said that most of you probably wouldn't understand, but go back and listen to the video. I just showed you on the daily chart what I was referring to. Uh, but that would be a level that I would look for if it was to take out that low there, and then maybe as much as that. If it were to come out 
of you know out of the blue with a with a down day. And I think that's gonna be it. Everybody got When it's clean, you won't have all of these conflicting PD arrays. How do you know which one to use? How do you know which one to pick? Most of the time, you're asking that during periods of consolidation like that. And this is the problem of trading in this environment. You won't know. Whereas if you have a run that's established, and it's clearly making a way to a old high or old low or something above the marketplace that would be inefficient, that tendency to want to go that direction strongly makes it easy to see which PD array exists because it doesn't have a plethora of conflicting, you know, fair value gap and volume and balance um, order blocks. They're all converging in small little range between the high formed at 951 and the low formed at 1028. So if the market's being held in consolidation, as we clearly see it is here, Every time it creates a, an area where I would like to participate in, it doesn't guarantee it's going to deliver. It just means that there's more of them forming. And because there's more of them forming, there's conflicted analysis presented by that. So it's imagine your best buy scenario or setup and your best sell scenario forming at the same time. Which one do you use? Think, which, which one are you going to use? Who knows, right? And that's the problem with trading in conflicted consolidations like this. You, you don't know. No matter what pattern, whatever methodology you use, it's going to present both sides of the coin constantly. It's going to keep flipping the coin. And heads has enough opportunities in the day to lose money, and tails has enough opportunities to lose money in the day. And you don't realize before long, you know, you've wrecked yourself and you've done damage to yourself and drawing down, losing and then at the end of the day, you look at it, like, oh, I wish I, I saw it. I knew it was consolidated. I knew it was choppy. But what it should have, could have doesn't put the money back in your account, does it? And it doesn't fix the, the pride issue that you feel. You have to know with a great deal of conviction, where is it likely to go next? I cannot make this any more paramount than than I'm trying to do today. You have to know. You have to know. Where is it going? And I know there's going to be people that say, you don't know if it's going to go there. No, nobody knows with a great deal of assurity that it's going to go there. But you can look at price action and measure from previous price runs and what price usually does and that's never an indication of what it's going to do in the future it's not a guarantee it doesn't mean it's going to you know paint out that same way it just means that all things being equal it's likely to do a run to an old low or an old high whatever one is likely to occur in a better cleaner environment where it's not being held in consolidation like this the market's not being permitted to move. So when it's like this, you're forced to sit on your hands and then wait for it to move, get out of this mess, and not necessarily a breakout because I'm not a breakout trader. But once it moves and goes to a higher level time frame, key level, then we can anticipate a specific price run. And then it's easier to do that because when those occur, Excuse me. The uh, my stomach is talking to me. I'm starving. <laughs> There's a uh, volume imbalance in here. It's touching the top of the fair value gap there, and we're back in this volume imbalance there. So we're still dead center midpoint of the range between 951 and 1020. What was it? 
So we have a fair value gap in here. A swing high is broken. Volume and balance. Watch and see if there's any reaction after repricing to it in here. This lower here, we're in consolidation, so you got to look and see what has been taken recently. Sell side's been taken. So where is the buy side? Even in consolidations, it's going to run from buy side to sell side, buy side to sell side. What is it just recently taken? Sell side. So there's buy side, and there's the delivery to the 41.21 level. Now, that doesn't mean anything. It means absolutely nothing. But what did you learn today? You learned how to anticipate choppy opens at 9.30. You've discovered what it's like to be in high resistance liquidity runs, which is nerve-wracking. It's very frustrating. You've seen the potential turning point with the SMT between the NASDAQ low and S&P. You've seen the conflicting analysis that even though there may be a fair value gap. There may be a order block. There may be a volume imbalance. Without having a clear idea where the market's likely to go, like where is it wanting to go, if you don't have that, everything else is going to hurt you. And if the market's not going to move, nothing's going to work. It's going to go back and forth, back and forth. But when you get closer to that lunch hour, and usually around 10.50 to 10.10. In that area, there's a lunch macro. Okay, 10.50 to 11.10. I want you to annotate this on your charts every day. Study what price is doing. Oh, well, don't do that. <laughs> Okay, annotate your chart like that and just, I guess, record it and annotate it in a way where you know what you're, you're referencing there. New York lunch macro. In your notes, it would be better if you had your annotation visible, right? And you want to study when the market's consolidating, okay, you're going to get that price run between 1050 and 1110. What that does is it's a it's kind of like the last ditch before yes, traders do take lunch. Okay, they absolutely do take lunch. The algorithm doesn't take lunch, but it likes to stimulate the the volume and sentiment going into that lunch hour. Because lunch hour can be a pause and continuation of a trending day, or it could be a reversal, or it could just stay sideways and do nothing and chop. Here's the wonderful thing about this 10.50 to 11.10. 10. 
it doesn't matter which one of those conditions are there. You're going to see a move form between 1050 and 1110. And what is likely to occur is where hasn't that liquidity been tapped into yet? And that's what I was walking you through here. We've already seen sell side taken. Where's buy side? Here. And where I've outlined it here. And if it goes to that level, it's going to expand up into that area here. Now, if it was taken out that low here, I mentioned that we would look for it to go here. We didn't take the low out. We took a market shift bullish here. I told you to watch this one here. Even if it just trades in there, that's where you enter. It's called close proximity entries. You don't need a breaker. Okay, you don't need a breaker to trade above and come back down and touch it. You can do that. That's how I taught it. But I don't I don't require just that. If I know where I'm likely to see price go to, buy side and buy side between 1050 and 1110, you're going to see a price run that's originating then. It will happen regardless if there's a consolidation day, a reversal day, or is a trend continuation after lunch. It doesn't matter. You're going to see a price run begin at that. It's a small little segment of price action and time, and it's going to run for liquidity. It's going to run for the liquidity that has not been tapped yet. And that's what you're seeing here. Okay, uh, The levels inside the, the consolidation between uh, 920... I'm sorry, 951 and 1028. While they're in there, everything is going to be conflicting. But once you get to 1050 to 10, I'm sorry, 1050 to 1110, that lunch macro, and you've seen me do executions of this on my Twitter feed, it's based on this logic. You have to look for where hasn't it been tapped into yet? What hasn't been affected? Who hasn't been upset? Where is the pain threshold for the people that feel the safest? Well, anyone with a stop above this high felt safest, especially when it dropped from here. And when it went down lower than that low there, and then it created a short-term high, traded back down in, and then rally after that fair value gap. Once it ripped higher above here, that is a shift in market structure during a specific time of day, 10.50 to the 11.10. That's algorithmic. It has nothing to do with harmonic patterns. It has nothing to do with Elliott Wave, nothing supply and demand. It's absolutely internally built. It's part of it. It's codified. It's code. It's there. It will run for liquidity that has not been tapped. Now, this many times can be a key point for the day, and it never returns back down below it or above it in reference to if it was going, you know, going lower. I'm not teaching it for you to have that understanding alone. It's for you to study how to, if you're watching these consolidation days like this, study between 1050 and 1110 and see if you don't get a price run like this. Don't take my word for it. Go back in through charts and go forward with it. We've seen how they, <clears throat> excuse me, they opened it and worked that old low multiple times. Inducing new shorts to chase it going lower. I mentioned this level down here. That's a fulcrum point. It has to go below that low. If it goes below that low, then you can see lower prices. But it didn't go lower than that. We had sell side taken. This right here. This return back down in. I'm sorry. Into that fair value gap right here that price run to here this is your last like bus stop before you get to your your destination if you don't get on that bus you ain't getting on it that's why i said watch this one here as soon as it traded into it or into this candle here as close as you can get inside that volume of balance that's it now watch what happens i'm going to look in this small little segment of price action right here Okay, actually, I mean, I didn't, I moved it wrong. Sorry, let me I make sure I do it right. Okay, and inside this little area, I'm going to change the color to uh, um, I'm 
yellow and it stands out. It's not perfect, but it's enough to get our attention. So I'm going to drop down into a 15 second chart. What do you see? I'm not going to say it, but what do you see? Two down close candles. High, low. Fair value gap, order block inside the volume imbalance. It trades down to it, and then boom. That's your lunch macro right there using the 15 second chart. So when you see me doing these big run ups and I'm building and building and building, I may be recording the one minute chart, but you're not seeing me using all the other charts in front of me. Then I'm looking at that. That right there is my, my hammer. Okay. And when I swing that, it gives those big, nice price runs. So don't run away from this lesson thinking, I'm beating my chest, look how smart I am, because I was showing you, even in these conditions, it's difficult for me as well. And how you need to identify what it's likely to do to you as a trader. How does it, how did it feel for you today, watching price action? Were you frustrated? Were you anxious? Were you second guessing? Were you thinking that you know, they changed the algorithm? <laughs> They're not changing shit, okay? The bottom line is, it's going to stay like this. It's going to continuously do this, but the markets are going to do one of three things. Okay. It's going to consolidate or it's going to go higher or it's going to go lower. That's it. That's, that's the only things that can happen or they don't trade that day because of a holiday. So the, those things are pretty straightforward. And unless you can frame the outcome to the market's likely to go higher to this level, this is my magnet and price this is draw on liquidity. This is where the market's going to reach to. If you can't clearly see that in your analysis, you are gambling. And I don't care what methodology you use or who you taught or who taught you. And, you know, any, it doesn't matter unless you know where it's likely to go to. There's no way you can be consistent. None. Zero. Because every logic, even mine, if it's forced into the wrong conditions where the market's not, not going to move, even it will fail. All my PD arrays will fail if the market's not going anywhere. You have to have the most important element. Time. Time. Nothing is going to happen in price action until it reaches a specific time of day. A day of week. A week of the month. Month of the year. Seasonality. All those factors come together. And they agree. Like, like pins in a tumbler. You know, the lock turns. Everything comes together perfectly when it's all those other factors, but you just can't frame the whole trade idea on the basis of a simple order block or a fair value gap. There has to be other things. And you can see when you're met with additional difficulty, it's, it's next to impossible to feel confident. But when time enters the equation in the chat, <laughs> things change. Okay, things change, things become a little bit more clear. And it's like this in the last hour of trading too. There's three macros that run in that last three hours. Uh, in that last hour of trading between three o'clock and four o'clock, there's three specific macros. Not every day does all three of them occur. Usually two, but always one of them. I'm going to teach you those this year. I will be in the PM session doing them. But today, I want you to record how you felt. Don't communicate to me to Twitter because I'm not reading anything on Twitter. Twitter is just for me posting. Like I'm, I'm when I tweet something, I'm casting it out there into the abyss. Whoever's listening is going to listen. If you're going to ignore it, that's fine. I don't. I'm not looking for likes. You don't even need to like them anymore. It's just for me to be able to reach out to you on days that I'm not doing the live sessions. So, if you've enjoyed today. That doesn't necessarily mean that you found it easy, but if you found some insight from this, if it makes sense to see and understand when it's difficult, how to navigate it, what to do with it, um, if it was helpful to you, 
you know, give it a thumbs up. Otherwise, I'll just catch you on the next one. I don't know when it will be the second one this week. So um, today's Tuesday. I'm, I'm quite certain it won't be tomorrow. So it'll either be Thursday or Friday. We'll do our next one. But I will tweet that schedule in time when we would be meeting again by way of Twitter. Okay. So hopefully you, know, you got something out of this. If not, I apologize. I can't make the market do what I wanted to do. I have to wait for it to do what I know it's likely to do. And there'll be better market days. I promise you will be smiling. But you should be happy about this one because it's teaching you where you're going to lose money and blow your account. If you don't identify it, you will fall victim to that. Like everybody else has done in the past, you won't know it's coming until it's too late. So until next time, be safe.